Well, good morning and, and welcome particularly to those members of the public who have been kind enough to join us. Um, Emma, are there any apologies? Um, 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 apologies from Anushka. From Anushka. And Caroline Downs. Thank you. Um, Caroline Downs. And then behind us on the screen, we've got there, Edgar, Cathy. Morning. Morning, Cathy Stone, and Obi Hassan. Morning. Uh, all of whom are joining us from various parts of the UK. Um, are there any uh, any declarations of interest? No. So should we have a, a quick look at the minutes? I, I'm assuming people have looked at the minutes. And so, um, any ten, I'll just go through page by page. Page one, two, three, four, five. I think we're right through. I think everything that is of interest is in the action. So I think that's fine. So we've approved the minutes. Thank you very much. Um, now I should apologise to you all. Foolishly, I've forgotten my glasses. But fortunately, my able assistant has got his. <laughs> so we're going to cope between us with this. So. Um, Chris, can you just do the action track? Yes, yeah, so there's a number of actions here. Um, the, the first one's relating to questions to the public. Um, uh, JM and PA to contact members of the public to discuss the concerns that were raised during that meeting. There's an update here from the 27th of November. The meetings have been arranged and will take place, um, or have taken place on the, by the next meeting. Um, is that right? It took place yesterday. Yesterday. Myself and Claire met with the lady. Lovely, thank you. Waiting list report, um, CT to link with CG to discuss waiting list management strategies further. Claire? Hi, yes, so we met for the first time yesterday, so we just need to obviously get a date in the day to do that, and we've got the uh, waiting list made this day. Lovely, and we can pick up sort of the issues around waiting lists later in the, the agenda. Um, the next one is quality and performance rates, the quality and performance report for month nine, PA and CT to provide a separate briefing paper detailing the funding issues regarding the community dental scheme and what the implications are. I've discussed this with Claire and first of all we need to take a paper to the SLT, the senior leadership team, and so we can review it there and then yeah. onward to the board. So I think yes. we're probably talking about the January meeting. Yes, I mean, the, the paper's been produced for SLT so that will come in this month and then we can have Lovely. next month. That's, that's coming back for January? Yes, yes, so yes. it will come to SLT between now and the next board Good. and then we'll bring it to Thank you. the next meeting. Um, sorry, can I ask a question yes, of course. about the uh, dentistry mm. situation? I'm not sure whether it's currently here or later, but um, I just wondered if the piece of work that, that's coming in January, has it been um, worked through with um, community medical services? I'm quite conscious, obviously, dental services have a long history of being provided in the hospital, but they're actually community mm. dental services. And in other jurisdictions, they will be provided in the community by primary care practitioners. Yeah. Um, and there has been discussion in the past about how that might be rolled out in Jersey. And obviously, one of the issues is how it's funded. Um, and clearly, there is an issue to be debated with um, staff in that department about access to potentially health insurance for them to ensure that people do have access to community dentistry in the community. And I just wondered if that would be a to work between them. Yes, so it's mm -hmm. obviously we've been in the commission recently with. Um, using primary care dentistry on island, which has reduced the waiting list, um, and there's been multiple discussions with the sector and also CLS in relation to the hip, and that's all in the paper. And it would be a real pity, I think, if it went back into being a hospital delivered service when it doesn't need to be. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, a, it's a key factor. Um, the Chief Officer's report, CP to share the Be Heard survey results with the non-executive directors. Cheryl? So I've met with um, three of the um, non-executive directors and want to remain open to reschedule another time with, with Anthony. Lovely. Thank you. The next one was around the PICA survey, the previous PICA survey on patient experience and the questions in the current survey to be provided to the NEDS. Jesse? Yes, that's been provided. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, there's another one we'll pick a survey. A verbal verbal update can be given to the board in December. 
linked to action 59, Jessie? That, that's in relation to the Pecker survey report coming to board. Um, I have spoken to the Pecker survey on the timelines. Um, the survey will close the middle of January. We'll get some preliminary information in February, but we'll get the final report from Pecker in March. And the Pecker um, team have offered to come to board in March if we would like to help provide, to provide feedback on the results to us. And I thought it was something we could take to patient panel as well. Chair, yeah, that's excellent. Um, would that be best done in a, in a kind of workshop format or at the board? Which, what um, do you I, I don't mind if I ask them just to block out the, the two days, the two days. Um, to see what would be best. Sorry, just as a point, can I just remind people, you've, you've yes. got a microphone there. I don't think the, the members of the public can hear you. No, no. I can barely hear you. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, just, and we can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so yeah, it's good. very difficult to... Uh, right, I shall so shout a bit louder. We can hear you. Thank you, good. <laughs> if, if you can't hear us, and assuming you want to hear us, <laughs> then will you wave and we'll speak up, yeah. Right. I would very much like to hear you. If you could all speak up, I can't hear anybody except Chris. Right. We will try harder. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and if our voices drop, as they tend to over time, then wave again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Right. And the final action, uh, the finance report from month five at that time was uh, the chair and, and CB will discuss the lack of budgetary information available to budget holders with KPMG. Obi Hassan has um, um, responded to that. I don't know whether rather than me read it out, Obi. Do you want to just uh, say where we're at as regards to budget information, but particularly focused on whether this or this does not impact on our ability to hold people to account? Uh, 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 Chris, I can't hear you very much. The budget information... Th this was the issue that about at the time that the budgetary oh, yeah. information yeah. been available yeah. and we were trying to find out with the new finance government finance computer yeah. system what that all meant for us. Thank you, apologies. Yeah, the timeline is still that we would be getting access to uh, because there are access issues in terms of users to uh, for the system that we would still be looking at access around January, February time. Uh, so Q1 is the timeline. You know, we're also pushing very hard. And the mitigation, as I uh, reported last time, that we put in place is our finance business partners do manual interventions providing those reports to budget holders on a monthly basis and through our uh, capable performance review processes. That's how the accountability works. It is a manual intervention, it would save a lot of time, but the timeline remains uh, Q1 before we are able to automatically get access to it for all budget holders. Okay, thanks. So for those that didn't hear that, I think in summary, that because of the new finance system the government has, we're not going to get automatic access um, until quarter one of 2024. However, we've got a manual system in place um, to ensure that we can continue to um, hold uh, budget managers to account. So despite the fact that we don't actually have the automated system yet, it's not interfering with our ability to hold people to account for money, but it is a manual system, which of course uh, is not ideal. So quarter one, we should be uh, receiving information automatically. Obi, that's what you're saying? Uh, yes, that's correct. That's correct. And anyway, we're obviously very keen because it saves a lot of time for the uh, finance business partners in uh, doing value-added uh, uh, services uh, for value-added advice. Okay, so we're also very keen at pushing that very closely. Thanks very much, Obi. Okay, and that was the end of the action tracker. Let, let me just be clear, with particularly with the public, about the action tracker. Um, as you know, there are quite a long list of actions, and against each of them there is who's responsible for following through on them, and when they come back to the board. So the ones, we've, the ones on the list today are the ones that were due back to this board. But I, I, I'm, I'm very keen that you understand that that doesn't mean we've lost the others. They will all come up in the agreed time scales, so that we're keeping a very tight grip on those actions that we said we would take, and it'll come back to they will come back to a public meeting of the board in, in due time. So an example would be today we just agreed that something would come back in January. That will be on the action tracker for January, and will be spoken to, spoken to at the January board. Okay. 
Um, not a great deal from me, just to update you on where we are with, with board appointments. Um, as you know, an appointment to the, the chair wasn't made, um, and it's for that reason that I, I was asked if I would carry on for a, a further month. So my, my contract now expires at the end of December. So this is becoming something of a ritual, so that each time I say this is my last board meeting, and wish you well. <laughs> so on this occasion, this is my last board meeting, and I wish you well. Um, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, you all know that there's a fifth non-executive to be appointed, and I'm told that process is underway. Uh, and so I, I would hope by the January board that the fifth and final non-exec will have been appointed. Uh, the only other issue I should, should tell you about are the assurance committees. Those of you that follow these things closely will know that in the past there were three assurance committees, each of them chaired by a deputy minister. Um, now, to be frank, when I wrote my report on the trust, I was pretty critical of those assurance committees because I didn't feel they provided any assurance to anybody in a very coherent way. So I, I felt although people were clearly trying hard, it wasn't a terribly useful process. So we, we are still thinking about it, but the direction of travel is that we will probably have four assurance committees, the fourth of them to pick up areas that may not have been dealt with as thoroughly as they should have been in the past. So the two that come to mind is, is, is our role in commissioning services uh, and in social care. So we will have a fourth assurance committee, and the way that we will guarantee assurance is that each of those assurance committees will be chaired by one or two of the non-executives. So consistent with the, way, with the way the board works, that there are independent non-executives, that here on the right, there will be independent chairs of each of those assurance committees, and reports on those assurance committees will come back to this board in the public domain. And that's the process that we've not yet quite finalised. We've got to work out the timings of it and, and who chairs what and all of that. But just to be clear with everyone, that's the direction of travel. Uh, and that was agreed at the, at the workshop yesterday. So we're making progress on what will then be the, in place the, the, the senior governance of the organisation. Yeah. And, and you'll recall, all of you, that we are not a statutory organisation, we're an advisory organisation. We advise the minister and the accountability runs through the organisation uh, through the, the directors to the non-execs and then through myself or whoever's chair uh, through the chair to the to the minister and the non-executives met with the minister last night and through the minister to government to the public so we, we are making substantial progress on that uh, that clear need in my view to have a line of accountability which runs from people who work in the organization to the public who are they are, they are required to serve. So that's being put into place and I hope that the January board uh, that the final story will be given on that and so it will be perfectly clear to all how it's designed to work. I, I just pause, are there any questions particularly on the public on that? It, it is important that people understand the mechanism. Okay, good. Your report, Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to remind everyone, for the purpose of my Chief Officer's report, it is an attempt, and there's some refinements we need to make, to summarise the key issues that have been facing and continue to face HCS um, in the previous month. Um, the idea being that whilst most of the areas in my report are covered in detail in reports on the agenda, that really what I want to ensure is one for the board that there's a, a summary, but in particular for members of the public and indeed the staff of HCS and others, that if they don't have the time to read the, the very comprehensive documents that we produce here, that at least people might be able to read my report and give them a flavour of what's going on across HCS. And I think uh, we're, we're very keen to um, ensure that, as I say, if, if people don't have the time to read the full set of papers that uh, we are able to provide people with a, a summary of the key issues. Now I'm going to take the report as read but I do want to just highlight a number of things for um, this meeting. Um, 
Delayed transfers of care or medically fit for discharge, as um, uh, it's known, is we have seen a slow down or reduced position over the last two months. Um, so we're seeing in November between 27 and 30 patients, it's still far too many of course, that um, are in hospital beds, acute hospital beds, that could be cared for and should be cared for in other settings. And uh, that compares to somewhere around the 40 mark that we were seeing during September. So it has reduced um, and um, we will take a and bring a plan or a, a document to the January board as stated in my report on that issue. It is a, a perennial issue. It's one that obviously faces the National Health Service as well. If you read the media, it's something that is a, I guess, a wicked problem, but we do need to solve it because it has all sorts of consequences. I say the board are very familiar with those consequences, but it is not, quite frankly, good care and we need to find a way to break the cycle of patients that are sitting in hospital that really shouldn't be there. I think the last place that people really want to be is in a hospital. So delayed transfers of care is, continues to be an issue, but we see a slowing of it. Um, the finance report in the uh, papers relates to month 10. I think Obi might have had early sight of the results for month 11 and will um, talk to us about his views around the forecast for year end, but I am, um, and I'm, I'm using um, Obi's phrase, uh, cautiously optimistic that we will deliver um, this year's uh, requirements as set by government around savings plans, but you'll see that in month 10 we are showing a uh, slowing down of the 0.2 million in the underlying uh, monthly <coughs> run rate. So that is, is good news. Clearly we have massive challenges facing us in 2024 with the need to make 12 million pounds worth of savings of which as I say in the report you'll see the plans um, or the intentions that we have during the course of next year but this year say cautiously optimistic that we will end the year in a position that we agreed with the Treasury. Um, on the clinical governance front you'll see in the report that the numbers of overdue SIs has improved and um, so that's a positive, <coughs> we've still got a long way to go and we are focusing on um, those SIs that still remain outstanding, which is not good enough, um, from 2022. And we have prioritised those SIs in particular. The work continues on uh, improving the number of out-of-date policies that we found uh, across the organisation and again focusing on those that um, have the, um, or focusing on the priorities, those that have a clinical uh, implication of those areas that we're focusing on first. And I'm pleased to say that um, for the first time we have been successful, HCS, in joining the national audit programmes, which will allow us now to benchmark our services uh, against others. And we're developing the national audit programme for HCS um, for 2024. So I think at some point we will bring that also to the board so you can see the areas that we're particularly focusing on uh, in the way of audit. But that's the first time we've. Um, uh, done that uh, uh, in HCS. Uh, the electronic patient records, we're still addressing some of the outstanding issues around maxims and we're targeting training in those areas where we feel that that needs to be improved and also something called delegations um, from clinical staff to others to improve their uh, efficiency, uh, which was one of the uh, bigger issues that we faced in the implementation of maxims. It's I'm pleased to say, though, that the new integrated patient record is now live on our intensive care unit um, and the electronic prescribing and medicines administration continues to roll out and that has also been implemented on ITU. Um, maternity pro uh, improvement programme, we've got a document in the, on the agenda. Just to say that at the time of writing, you'll see in my report that uh, with a total of 80 out of 127 recommendations showcase, showcasing established business as usual processes in the time between me writing this report and now that number is not 80 but it's 88 so we've made further progress. Um, acute medical improvement plan, uh, there's reference to uh, a paper that went to our senior leaders senior leadership team on the 29th of November that was discussed. There is some further work we need to do particularly around the financial consequences of that so that will come back again to an SL T. Um, new healthcare facilities programme. I mentioned there that um, 
the demolition work is due to start. Well, actually, it started today, and there's some, been some media um, uh, uh, about that. I haven't read it. It's only come out today. But the demolition of Overdale has now commenced uh, today. Uh, clinical governance. Um, no, we've done that. Um, maternity. Uh, waiting lists, obviously, really important issue for us and indeed everyone sat here and the public. Um, just in summary, the outpatient waiting list volumes, so this is outpatient, has decreased. Um, those areas that still present a problem, ophthalmology, ENT, uh, dermatology, trauma and orthopaedics, um, is a, an area where I think as a board we uh, need to do a deep dive uh, on those particular services and look at the challenges we've got and the solutions to that. Uh, but just to say the outsourcing contract um, has now been awarded for ophthalmology, so Claire, we will start to see a reduction in waiting times in outpatients for um, ophthalmology. The percentage of patients waiting greater than 19 days for their first outpatient appointment sadly has increased. Now that's despite a reduction, and we'll go back to dental, despite a reduction in the dental um, waiting times uh, over 90 days. So again, something we are very conscious of and need to, to look at that. Diagnostic waiting times have decreased, and that's a very positive sign. And in particular, MRI, um, the recovery plan is delivering that we were at the beginning of the year, we were at 52 weeks for a routine MRI. By the end of this calendar year, um, we're on trajectory to have reduced that to six weeks, so much more acceptable and in line with what you might find elsewhere. Um, so that's good news. Um, the elective inpatient waiting list has increased marginally um, and whilst elective day case activity has increased um, we're still not at the level that we need to be at as regards to elective inpatient admissions um, and they're not where they were pre the implementation of maxing so again a big focus on that protracted delays in particular remain in the same key areas particularly lower limb uh, operations and upper gastrointestinal surgery. So again, in the deep dive, those are the areas that we need to look at. And uh, finally, as regards to waiting lists, uh, mental health yeah, still has significant challenges, particularly in ADHD and some of the specialist diagnostic services um, and for psychological therapies, and that remains a key concern for us. Um, again, another area that we can deep dive into, recruitment, um, and staffing is a major issue here. Um, we, uh, Andy, interviewed for psychiatrists the other day, but sadly felt there was no one um, suitable to appoint, and that continues to be a challenge for us as regards to mental health waiting lists, is workforce um, in that area. Moving on to workforce, I think a key issue to highlight here is that our vacancy rate has dropped from 18% to 16% over the last two months, so that looks like a trend. And that's despite the number of funded posts uh, having been uh, increased over that same period. So um, we've seen an increase in funded establishment because of investment by government. Um, but over the last 12 months, we have seen an increase in 224 whole time equivalent staff in post across all departments, um, which is in particular an increase of 49 doctors and 46 nurses. Um, over the last month, there has also been a reduction in the numbers of agency workers covering vacancies um, to the level of about 10 whole time equivalents. So we are starting to see, and I'm pleased to say, some movement in recruitment. We've still got a long way to go, um, but I think the effort that's been put in by teams around this table and in HCS and in um, Central HR are starting to pay some dividends. The nursing microsite um, is uh, about to go live um, very shortly and again we're hoping that um, we will see some benefit from, <coughs> from that. Uh, I'm pleased to see the Freedom Speak Up report on the agenda. I think the fact that we're now seeing people coming forward and speaking up is um, a really positive sign. Uh, it is part of our cultural change programme. We have been encouraging staff to use the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian, which they're, they're doing, and, and, and that's in the report. But also, we're also seeing people coming to us directly. Uh, I, I meet with staff 
on a regular basis to listen to their experiences and issues that they have, as I know my colleagues do. So for me, that's some green shoots that we are starting to see now, people using um, the Speak Up system. Um, you'll see some quality issues there where we've seen some improvements. Um, we're seeing incidents of the uh, Category 2 pressure damage um, is decreasing. Um, we've seen improvements in clinical audits focusing on food and nutrition, and falls have decreased. Uh, infection prevention control continues to demonstrate low levels of infection, and we're particularly conscious over the winter period to keep an eye on that because often you will see increases during the winter. Um, 2024 priorities yesterday, and uh, the chair alluded to, we had a workshop with the board where we were starting to discuss the priorities for 2024 and we will bring those priorities uh, to the January meeting. Um, and uh, again, we do like to, or I like to put in my report, some of staff engagements and achievements um, from our, our 3,000 plus staff that we employ. You'll see those listed there. Um, I won't go through them. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just first of all, clarification. So adults or children's ADHD waiting time? Adults. Okay, then I would urge you not maybe to focus so much when you've got other criteria, because I think that's related to increased demand rather than, uh, rather. Than, but the one thing that does stand out is 22 months for ophthalmology, because I'm assuming those are people who are getting older, who the risk of falls, uh, which will create even more morbidity. Uh, can I just get an assurance that that is? Because 22 months is a long time. It's too long, it, yeah. Well, it's far too long to yeah. wait. You can go blind in that time. Can I get an assurance of that, that you are prioritising some of these uh, waiting time initiatives so that it isn't just done on who calls the loudest, but actually what really needs... Because dermatology, you can sort out with, derma, with photography. It's, it's, not, yeah. it's not rocket science. Uh, ophthalmology clearly uh, needs to be dealt with, as does all the things, because that increases your risk of falls if you're walking around the, a dangerous city. I just want assurance that, that we are focusing on what matters rather than you what you might get a sort of small political political yeah. imperative. No, absolutely, and, and certainly that's why we've, we've got the outsourcing um, programme that's now been agreed. And so ophthalmology is a key area because you're, you're, you're right, Claire, 22 months is just far too long. Um, and I don't know whether you want to pick that up when yeah. we go through the report. Exactly. Yes. If, if, if Claire over there can pick that up. In, in but it is a priority. Yeah. And tell us, I think, the specific about ophthalmology yes. and about orthopaedics. Orthopaedics, uh, I think, is completely different issues. I think there are different ways. And I, I see you've got the Getting It Right First Time czar really? coming, so I'm sure he can help find that, because a lot of that will be will be people that maybe don't need surgical procedures that can be managed in a different way. And finally, you talk about GPs with special interests. Nurses have special interests, and I'm assuming that we promote nurses to develop additional and enhanced skills. They are just as good at dealing with dermatological issues as GPs are. Yes, Claire, we do have specialist nurses. We've got specialist nurses in our ophthalmology department and in dermatology. So we do promote it and we're looking at the, we do some have, have some advanced clinical practitioners and we're looking at increasing our numbers of advanced clinical practitioners. Thank you. Thank you. And then Claire, will you pick up on those two specifics? Thank you very much. Any other questions for Chris or any points to be made? Sorry, me again, just one point. I know we're going to pick up maternity, uh, but what flags up in the maternity, and I hope we do discuss, is the postpartum hemorrhage rate, which, even though we put red, actually, the average, the, the top of the average, it should be 5%, so at least two more of those should be red, and which means I think it's five out of 12 months you've got a very high rate of PPH. These are mothers uh, who should be looking after their babies, not being on your wards, uh, having drips and blood put in. Just one comment from me. I, I think. Can you sorry. Yeah. Just, just one comment from me. I, I think I, I didn't want you to. Uh, want to I want people to understand this. This move towards comparing disorganisation. Can you hear now? Thank you. Yeah. Look, I, I wanted to say a word or two about comparing this organisation with other similar organisations 
through these audit programs, through these national audit programs. And that's something that um, I recommended uh, when I did my review. And, and it's really, a, I think, a key step forward because we will know for the first time how we are doing here as compared with others. So we get a sense, we'll have a sense of are we a safe organisation? Are we achieving what others are achieving? So that, that comparison that we'll be able to make is crucially important. And perhaps, perhaps we could, uh, and Jesse, we could bring to the January board those areas where those comparisons will be made so that people understand in these clinical areas, we're moving towards a point where we, will, where we can compare this organisation with other organisations. It's not just a standalone organisation. Uh, yes, a yes. supplementary point, I'm yeah. not sure I can reach as far as that, so if you don't hear me, do please wait. Um, it's just in relation to benchmarking, which I absolutely support, and I think it's something that we need to do more of. Um, I, I think the, the Lincoln International Audit Programme is excellent, but I'm just wondering in terms of benchmarking in general um, across the whole range of our services, I wonder if any thoughts being given to either drilling down within the NHS to find similar types of health system, so for example, looking at what's happening in, in the Highlands and Islands might be quite useful to us because they have similar types of challenges in terms of rurality, isolation, elderly populations. Um, and also I think we shouldn't overlook our fellow island health systems. Um, and, and I think we have in the past, and I think we may well be doing already, having close links with Guernsey, the Isle of Man, perhaps Gibraltar. Because quite often if, if they've got the same challenges as us and their benchmarking data seems to be better, there may be something there that we can learn and implement here. Uh, so it's quite interesting to hear if we're looking at broadening that benchmark. Yeah, we, we, we are, and of course, we are, certainly during the course of this year, we have been doing a lot of, having a lot of discussions with Guernsey in particular, not just on benchmarking, yes. but more widely around, because, of course, their challenges in some ways are even greater than ours. Um, but uh, we saw um, quite a lot of work um, when we were developing our financial recovery programme, for example, um, and working with KPMG's island group. So this is group that works on basically more or less every small island jurisdiction um, in the world to look at where they're benchmarked. Now, of course, some of those jurisdictions, there's very little information um, and, and uh, even less than we have. Um, but um, yeah, we, we do want to broaden that. But as I say, from the point of view of looking at the national audit programmes with the NHS, um, that is a step forward, as you said, Julie. Um, to uh, in the right direction, so we can actually benchmark. But we are definitely working with other uh, island jurisdictions. Kathy, thank you, Chairman. To um, assure the board with, the, with regards to the maternity paper, um, the links have already been established with the Integrated Care Board across Southampton, Isle of Wight, and um, the partnership in Portsmouth. Because one, they are, you have the rurality of an island population, but also it is where most of our women and babies will end up as part of their maternity journey if they are requiring um, intensive care and support. So that work has already been underway, and the newly developed maternity scorecard will represent that uh, benchmarking. Anything else on Chris's report? Yes, Simon. Just while we talk about this. Just while we're talking about benchmarking, I do want to emphasize the benchmarking, the aspirational. It's not an exercise in looking for somebody who is as bad as you and saying that's okay. It's very much about looking for opportunities to improve. And to bring up the point that um, they Claire made earlier, to actually know where we need to prioritize. So if we're quite good in specialty A, but we in specialty B, then we need the resources in specialty B. So it's a really useful exercise. And again, just to reassure people that the way the national audits are done, there is a sort of range. You know, we accept that for all sorts of reasons, things will vary. And what is within a range is acceptable, and what is out of the range is what you look at. So it is actually quite a useful process to drive improvement. Good. Thank you, Simon. Anything else following Chris's report? Good, okay, let's move on if we could to the uh, quality and performance report and we'll take one director after another on this. Start with you, Claire. Um, 
Um, I'm not going to focus, Chair, um, with your agreement on the waiting list metrics, because obviously we've got a more detailed paper uh, during the agenda further down. Um, so I think just to highlight to board today, um, we have seen some improvements uh, in the need to follow up uh, our DNA rate as predicted. We knew obviously we had some uh, IT uh, solutions to that and it's pleasing to see that that's starting to improve. Uh, some steady, well slow, but steady improvement of our theatre utilisation. Obviously many of these metrics are being put up in our clinical productivity work streams as part of our financial recovery programme. Um, and also I think pleasing to see that we've now got better evidence of our treatment commencing uh, in the emergency department. Um, so I think for me, obviously, continuing to focus on those metrics uh, with those work streams as described. Um, obviously, I want to continue to drive the theatre utilisation uh, and obviously getting a sort of further gain into that as we go into the new year. Obviously, noting the impact of winter. Uh, we know we've got some uh, more beds coming online. Uh, to help us uh, respond to that and any surge in activity. Uh, we're obviously looking at our percentage of day cases um, and particularly focusing on those as part of our um, review of our procedures of low clinical value uh, and obviously making sure that we are uh, got clinically effective pathways. Um, we're also going to then focus on the evidence of triage um, at, 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 in ED um, and looking further again at our rate of readmission. Uh, and obviously there's some points in the exception report in relation to those, so happy to take any questions on, on those metrics. And as I say, I'll focus on the ways in these ones. Can we just, so Claire, just the, the additional beds, because I guess the, yes. this is the 18 additional beds, isn't it? One eight. Yes, absolutely. So we've substantiated further beds in two medical wards, and then this winter, due to our refurbishment programme, we've got the ability to surge into a 28-bedded ward uh, if we need to, obviously, to respond to winter. Any questions for Claire? Just to kind of, sorry, Chair, just to kind of question the, the procedures of unnecessary um, limited effectiveness. Are they mandated not to do them, or is it just the choice of the surgeon? So, so it varies. So there are some specifications around there when there's obviously clinical judgment where it may still then be appropriate to proceed to surgery. But obviously, what it seeks to do is, is highlight those. We've been reviewing the policy as part of our clinical productivity. Um, so obviously there are some that are not commissioned as part, and then some that are, for example, tonsillectomy. I'd probably refer to some of my medical colleagues around some of those. So in other words, it is on clinical judgment rather than just the gut. So are you saying that the clinician can make the case that he will take out barracks veins on, on the state's funding if they make the case, or are there strict criteria about which varicose veins uh, uh, can be? I mean, I just want to know for my own sake. So it's, as is often the case, not straightforward because a lot of those uh, procedures come with caveats or you should have had... As, as always, which is why you need criteria, yeah, because yeah, otherwise yeah. it's the clinician. I mean... That, yeah, no, no, I, I, I yeah. appreciate that. Um, so do we implement them robustly? No, I don't think we, we, we do currently. Um, but that piece of work that is taking place, and I, I agree, we, we need to be clearer in terms of uh, our guidance to our clinicians. But if you take orthopedics, my specialty, as an example, um, there are many things that we do that are on that list, but it's making sure the patients have had the other treatments before proceeding to, to surgery. So is it fair that the board can ask, that we can ask for reassurance at some further date that we're given a list of those unnecessary procedures? Because if we're going to be of any use, it's got to be that things are done according to evidence, not according to, I, I take the point, but, but it's you either do them or you don't, and they're either clinically effective or they're not clinically effective. And in the end, they, if you do an unnecessary clinical procedure, you have a risk of harming a patient unnecessarily. So can we see those in our... Yes, but I don't think it's that straightforward. If you no, take <laughs> carpal tunnel, for example, um, the, the, which I do, uh, there are many of that's on that list, but uh, if you're not sleeping at night and uh, et cetera, et cetera, you know, at the end of the day, the patients may wish to have it and it, it, it can be effective. I think it, a lot of it is around making sure that we've followed a, a process through um, offered the other treatments uh, available before going to surgery, but absolutely, yes, we can bring that back. I, I think, Claire, just also to say that this is new to Jersey, so this is in the NHS, of course, that policies are around um, 
the uh, uh, procedures of limited clinical value have been around for ages, but certainly that doesn't seem to have been the case here. Uh, certainly, the last few years uh, they have been around for they have been around for a long time, uh, uh, yeah. but I, I don't think we've necessarily enforced the yeah. 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 way yeah. we should have. So, the, just to clarify, so we've reviewed the policy and our compliance to that will sit as part of the clinical productivity work, so we can understand what further um, capacity that it offers us, but also around clinically effective pathways. So we'll be reviewing the policy and then be able to describe that in more detail as part of that work stream. Can I we think ask that we should we see them along the NEVER event, so the fact that we can yes. see what, no, what the numbers, we don't need to see the exact detail, but again, alongside NEVER events, what the number are? I, I think there's a general point here, and maybe this is a very good example, isn't it, is that having a policy which we may or may not have doesn't necessarily mean that it's been embedded in, yeah. in business as usual. So we've got lots of policies, uh, but one of the jobs... For, for me and indeed my executives to change team and indeed the board is making sure that those policies are implemented. Um, it's the policy as we uh, agreed this year to follow NICE guidelines. That's uh, sort of in some ways the easy bit. It's ensuring that that's embedded and clinicians do follow gui NICE guidelines is the challenge that we've got. So it's, it's probably one of those examples um, that we're all trying to tackle around this table is ensuring that good policies and good clinical practice is actually embedded in what we do, rather than just sitting in a policy. Yeah. Well, I, I very much welcome what, what you said, Chris. And what, can you use the microphone? Yes, I can do. If, if, if this, does that help? Yeah. I, I very much welcome what Chris has, has just explained. That the first step is to for the organisation to understand in all of its parts that these various processes have to be followed. Clinical guidelines, national audit, this is a third area. So all of these drive safety and drive quality. First step is you have the policies in place, and to some extent the organisation has those, and to some extent it hasn't. And we're, we're trying to change that, and I think succeeding in changing it. As everyone's saying, the more difficult bit is usually getting compliance to it. That's what one would see anywhere. And I think you're right, Claire, we should, we should ask for a view on the compliance, often much harder to measure, frankly. But I, I think the first step is what comes back to the board. National, the national audit processes are an example. They come back, this is what we are intending to do. And then at a later point, this is what we're actually doing. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, I think, does that address your, your point? Absolutely, it's fine. We drive that process through. Simon. <coughs> I was going to say proportionality, it would be relatively easy to produce a report on a regular basis that says the number of procedures on that list, the, the different procedures on that list could be done. Um, because it, it's, it's a long list, it's the same list that basically is only just been produced a few years ago, but yeah. the evidence is the same, surprise. Uh, there are some things I'm quite commonly, when you aren't going to talk, uh, we can produce that quite easily as a table report. It might then be more work and do we need to make a decision about proportionality or do you deep dive into someone and say, well, you know, to what extent are the exceptions justified? The obvious question for the board is if it's a very large number, it's unlikely that that many real genuine clinical exceptions, but the, the, the numbers can be produced easily. The narrative might be a bit harder. Okay, thanks for that, Simon. Um, just to get the timing of this, so in January, we're going to have, this is the list of audits we're doing. And then my suggestion is in February or March, we have this list of procedures. And as you say, Simon, the numbers against them. Because if the numbers against these procedures are high, then clearly that begs the question of well, why is that happening then? Yeah? Yeah. So, so, so people are aware. In January, we'll look at one aspect of it. In February or March, perhaps you would choose, Patrick, we'll look at another aspect of it. That these things come back into the public domain and we, and we can be clear with the public as to what's happening in, in Jersey in these areas. I think it's probably unrealistic to expect to produce more than them, but we definitely my executive colleagues who used to be putting pressure on them. It's probably unrealistic to produce more than the numbers for January because yep. um, uh, of the, the work. Absolutely, and I was being a bit more generous than saying February or March because yeah, I, I, I recognise this is not so. 
So I think in February or March the numbers come back and then I'm sure that the non-executives will want to interrogate some of those numbers. Good, thank you. Claire, are you? Yes. Good. Have we, have we addressed, Claire, Claire over there, have we addressed your questions about ophthalmology and orthopaedics yes, sufficiently? So we'll pick that up with the waiting list paper. We'll pick okay. That up. okay. And I'll right. talk to Claire and we'll communicate. Okay, thank you very much. Just right. To my to Andy. Thank you. So the, the, the KPIs are relatively static around mental health and social care this month. Um, I do want to pick up and particularly play into to Claire's point earlier about measuring the thing that's important. When we redesigned community mental health services, we've now been operating a new model for a year. And the two things that we particularly wanted to focus on was access, because sometimes people were waiting for months to get into community mental health services, and making sure that when people have been in hospital, they were seen within 72 hours on discharge. That's a patient safety KPI that's driven by the evidence that demonstrates that if people are going to kill themselves when they leave in patient mental health care, they would do that within 72 hours more normally. I'm really pleased with the performance in this area. We are very, very um, far away from where we were two years ago. We are not quite achieving the, we gave a very, a very um, long stretch target of 85% around access. Um, but the crisis team, and particularly routine referrals, we're seeing 82%, 86% of people, um, 82% of people within 10 working days that referred into mental health services. So the waiting isn't about accessing mental health services, and it's certainly not about accessing crisis services. The waiting relates to treatment in psychological therapies. So we're assessing 98% of people within our target range in psychological therapies. So we're doing assessments. It's then accessing the treatment that's the issue. And in the specialist diagnostic services, which are the dementia assessment service, ADHD and autism, that's where our, our waiting targets sit. Clearly, we've got to do more of that. Um, but as per se, I'm particularly pleased that we seem to have stabilised the 72-hour um, follow-up target for adult mental health services, because that was something where we were way away. We're exploring why we don't see everybody within 10 working days, and often that's about choice. People are currently choosing that they don't want to be seen within 10 days, they might want to be seen in 11 days, 12 days, 15 days, but we, we look at that every month um, to understand why we don't achieve, in any single case, the, the, the access target. The only other thing I wanted to comment on was the learning disabilities and um, people with a, who have had a physical health check within the last year which is sitting frustratingly at around 74 to 76%. The learning disabilities team are doing an in-depth look at this. And one of the things that we're finding is that some people are declining physical health checks from us because they're having them from other providers, particularly from primary care. Um, so we're going to try and rethink how we measure that metric or indeed whether we're, we're counting the right thing at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Any questions to Andy on? Yes, Tony. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Andy. And um, we've had discussions about the, the relevance and efficacy of some of the targets anyway, really. Some of those that were set perhaps quite a long time ago for whatever reason. Um, because the risk is that we chase the wrong things if we're trying to you know, drive performance up in areas which have less significance than others, really, I guess. Um, are you moving on to other social care or are you not? Yes, so, so I've talked about the, L, the LD target. The other, the other two targets for adult social care, as you know, are the number of assessments that are completed and authorised within three weeks. This is a process assessment and the, the team are achieving the target. Um, where they're not achieving the target is the support plans that are reviewed within six weeks. This is purely because we've diverted um, social work attention from some of that work to discharge and trying to move people through the, the hospital flow particularly. Um, but, but Tony and I have talked about this. We're looking to review all of these targets for social care. And to make sure that we have got the right metrics and that we're measuring the things that really matter. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and to add to that, I'm now aware <coughs> there are actually a, a, a whole string of other yeah. indicators within the service. Um, so, because my concern was that it looked as if we only had you know, two or three indicators of social care, I mean, this vast morass of other things. Not that this is a competition. But we're trying to put in place a fully people-focused, integrated health and social care system, are we really? And it feels out of kilt. But you're going to be bringing back, you know, with my support, a, a, a suite of indicators which will better focus on that objective of a fully integrated uh, 
pencil social care system. I think that's down for January, Chair. Is that right? That's right. Down for January. Good. Yeah. And it's so, really helpful to understand that this 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 paper only has a number of the KPIs that we measure, both for mental health and social care. There's a whole raft of performance indicators that we look at month on month with the services. This is just a highlighted few. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else from the policy report? Anybody else? No, no good. On to waiting list. On, thank you. Claire, waiting list. Thank you. Just put my microphone on, please tell me if you can't hear me. Um, so I'll take the paper as read. Um, obviously, um, in line with key discussions at uh, a previous board, we focused on uh, particular areas of challenge, um, and so there's updates in the paper in relation to those. So pleased to be able to describe the impact of the in-sourcing endoscopy, which, as Chris was alluding to, has reduced our diagnostic waiting list. Um, and obviously, we're, we're moving on to other more, uh, modalities. But I think you know, the key, key impact there, um, obviously we've been able to reduce those patients waiting for endoscopy by 815, so really great to see the impact there. Um, and there's been, again, um, in the paper we've included some patient experience feedback, um, and it's been really great to hear the positive experience of patients in relation to that. Um, ophthalmology, obviously we've alluded to, we've now completed the procurement process of that, so that additional capacity that we're going to deliver as part of the waiting list initiative will impact patients uh, as we go into Q1, um, and that's obviously an, an, an end-to-end uh, care for, for patients, particularly requiring cataract surgery, um, and so I'll be pleased to update the board as we go into January and February with the impact of that onto our waiting list. In relation to trauma and orthopaedics, Obviously, we have put on some uh, high volume and some additional outpatient activity, but we do know, obviously, that we have had uh, the impact of uh, the, you know, the medical surge into some of our elective areas, uh, but the work, again, Chris has alluded to in his report with the substantiation of the further beds um, and the work that we're doing with medicine, we will have that additional capacity, which will then um, allow us to put more inpatient beds, whilst there are obviously good numbers of, of both day case and elective activity, um, as noted in the QPR. But then, so the orthopaedic inpatient list, and that particularly the lower limb, Claire, as you were um, questioning in relation to, um, we'll see that impact in the new year. There's a detail around the MRI, and say we're pleased that that's now been reduced from 52 down to 11 week wait for a routine appointment and we've got good assurance on our urgent and soon and then again the community dental waiting list which we have reduced by virtue of the commission with our partners uh, in, in um, primary care uh, in community dentistry and we've got the paper that's going to SLT um, where we'll be discussing um, around obviously the funding to, to secure that service going forward uh, and our aspirations there. Um, dermatology has been uh, an area of focus uh, we have been very challenged um, in relation to recruiting into that capacity for some years um, and uh, some of your questions, Claire, around uh, developing and diversifying the workforce. Um, so with uh, nurse specialists in that area has been a key area of focus. Um, and um, what I haven't been able to do is actually build the trajectory of this additional capacity from locum, uh, locum staff, but that's a piece of work that I'm going to do uh, in the next few weeks and we'll obviously we'll update the board where I can give more assurance of the impact of that additional capacity on the waiting list. So I think some, some, some good work in relation to uh, our endoscopy, the ophthalmology hitting in Q1, um, diagnostics, and then picking up the focus on orthopaedics in terms of the uh, uh, waiting list as we go into the new year. Thank you, Claire. Claire, has that addressed your yes. question? I think it's amazing. Thank you so much. You're clearly doing a massive amount of work to try and address some of the, the issues. Thank you. Any other questions on that issue? Yes. So it's probably a very yeah. obvious one. I know the answer, but presumably we have all to crunch the numbers so we know that having uh, undertaken these um, various initiatives, we do have the sustainable resources in place that once we've reduced, we can maintain it to reduce rate, we'll just not see them creeping back up again. Correct. 
the threat. So I think particularly the, an area of focus with community dentistry, mm -hmm. you know, that's a that's a model that we've wanted to to you know evolve for a long time. Um, and actually through doing this commission, you know, we've demonstrated that we can commission safely. We've got good patient outcomes, um, and that I think has been a, a you know a, a piece of work that's been you know, good for, good for all, good for patients, good feedback from um, our partners in terms of the ophthalmology. I'm really hopeful that that's that's going to be a really positive pilot for us to demonstrate, particularly around uh, cataract, how we can modernise that pathway. And then again with the dermatology, looking at telemedicine, how we can bring that in to really then modernise our pathways, which will give us that sustainable, sustainable capacity. Obviously, there has been an element of COVID recovery, um, but um, yeah, so I think you know across many pathways, we can see where we're trying to then modernise, and then particularly, I think, was it Claire alluding to the work with GERF, will obviously give us really vital information in relation to those surgical specialties also. And just in relation to the processing around waiting list initiatives, um, I'm conscious, I think it's probably been quite frustrating within the department that the money is, is awarded quite early on and it seems to take a long time before um, you can get these processes up and running and then see the benefits of them. And I understand some of that's been a, a little bit around clunky procurement processes. And I just wonder if there's work going on in the background because obviously there may be other specialties in the future, or indeed some of these specialties may give us challenges in the future. And the thing about a waiting list initiative is you really want to try and get it in place quite quickly um, and not, and obviously you've got to follow good procurement guidance and make sure that you're getting good value for money. But I just wondered if there was something yeah, going on around I, that. Yeah, I think we pick up, I think we've learned a lot around the procurement processes that exist and uh, I know OB the sound has been intimately involved in many of them, um, and we do need to say, you know, maximise the, 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 the potential for speed. I think with the, the waiting list money we were given, where we were able to, or, or where there were schemes that were very much focused on just increasing our capacity through uh, local capacity, we were able to get on with that pretty quickly. Um, going out to tender um, for either insourcing or outsourcing, um, you know, there is a process that we have to follow and importantly of course one of the key elements of that contract is not just the money but the clinical governance that goes around that and agreeing with the potential providers that they've got and ensuring that they've got robust clinical governance to so when patients are treated let's say in Southampton that's a very clear plan about what happens when they return to the island and all forms part of that but I think we, we are learning from that that process uh, I think that you know the, the issue around sustainability is always a worry, isn't it? When you get waiting list initiatives, and you know we're having to look at the sustainability issue, of course, in the context of having to deliver a, a financial recovery plan of, of next year, 2024, of 12 million pounds savings. So these are the the debates that we're having at senior leadership team about how we can do that within the funding that we have available to us but I think yeah lessons to be learned around procurement um, but there is a clear benefit as we've seen in endoscopy and we will see in ophthalmology of securing uh, clinical capacity off island that either works on island or patients go to the UK to receive their their treatment. Thank you. Anything else on the waiting list of paper? Okay thank you. Obi, uh, your finance report, I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to hear you, Obi, so perhaps you could pause after the first uh, the Obi two or three minutes. Trying to get the microphone close to the computer to see whether that enhances. That <coughs> but, but have a go and then just pause, and if, if, if people can't hear you, I'll ask Chris just to summarise briefly what we've said up till that point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, just let me know if you can hear me clearly now while we carry on. Yeah, good, we can. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Shane. Um, so, on the financial position, um, I can report some positive news, although I must temper it that there are a number of challenges that remain. Uh, but I think this year's outturn is extremely important in how we exit this year in terms of run rate of expenditure and costs and income and how we get into delivering next year's recovery plan. So this year so far as at month 10, I'll also give a view about where I think we will end up at month 12, in other words at the year end. But as at month 10, which is what we're reporting, 
our um, deficit has increased to 25.6, as we predicted. Um, but the underlying run rate, which is an important measure for us, uh, although it's early days, has shown a slowing down. Whilst it's a small slowdown of 0.2 million per month, it does add up, and we are hoping that will accelerate over the coming months. Um, but that has shown some sign of improvement. Um, the UN, as a result of that, the UN deficit position we are forecasting at month 10, and I will update that in a second. It was 27.2, as per what the paper says, um, with the forecast run rate reducing by 700,000, so that instead of 2.5 million, which is our current run rate of excess of expenditure of income, in other words, the overspend, reducing to 1.7 million to exit at, at, at point 700,000 less than where we were previously. Um, the, did you want me to pause there? Can you hear me clearly, Chair? I think we, I think we can. Yes, Thank you. you're getting thumbs uh, up over you. Well done. Thank you. Um, I can also update, given the proximity or the approaching year end, that whilst we have not reported month 11 officially yet, uh, my view is, having looked at the numbers for month 11 and our updated forecast for month 12, that we are on target to deliver the 26 million deficit that we agreed with Treasury. So the 27.2 we were reporting in month 10, which was our forecast at that time, we're now more confident that we should be able to deliver the 26 million. And that is helped by uh, the three million pounds of FRP savings that we also committed to, which as Chris has highlighted, um, I still remain cautiously optimistic because as a balanced person, of course, whilst my optimism I always temper it with realism, which is until I get to the end and I've got it banked, I will call it cautious optimism, but I think we are on target to deliver the, the three million as well. Um, having said that, I think we still need to recognise the significant risks that remain in the underlying position where things are still move uh, against us so that we are continuously needing to mitigate further pressures coming forward. And that we have seen some of that. Uh, and, and, and so in staff costs, for example, um, whilst we have um, reduced our agency uh, run rate spend, we are at the same time, which by and by design, also recruiting into our substantive posts. And of course, that's what we want to do, because that's the right quality of care to do. But one of the financial impacts of that is that if we don't get the timing of substantive permanent staffing arriving and being uh, and agency staff being replaced by that, it gives us a cost pressure and certainly does so in the short term. And it is in sequencing it correctly is a, it is really, really important. However, we are seeing some of those cost pressures that whilst our recruitment campaigns in certain areas where it has been quite difficult to recruit are actually proving more successful, especially, for example, in social care uh, and in mental health and in other areas in medicine and surgery as well, it has not meant one in, one out. In other words, one substantive staff in, one agency out. And it is that difference that has given us a cost, underlying cost pressure, even this year. But we are still confident we're going to hit the 26 million, the 3 million target. My more, more, more my concern would remain that if this trend continues into next year, then we will then have to mitigate further. And therefore, it is important that we make sure that as per the FRP plan, which we work through in a phased way with the care groups, it is really important, really important that we. Over, you've got on to mute. Uh, sorry, uh, we, we, so, sorry. Um, we must ensure that as our substantive staff come in, we recruit to to replace agency. That is really, really important for us to maintain um, the uh, the financial within our financial budget as well. Um, that's, I think, the key highlight I was saying. In terms of uh, um, the underlying factors driving it remain the same, recruitment issues, 
uh, and some productivity issues, escalation, but, but we've been tackling those, and as I've just said, we have been at major campaigns on trying to get our recruitment in place, it is just making sure that the timing of those and replacing agency is right. Uh, we're also bringing down some of the uh, overtime expenditure, uh, and we have various schemes in it, uh, 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 to continue doing so. So, um, in terms of statistics, in terms of numbers, 191 agency staff reducing 473 vacancies, which are also, as Chris reported, reducing, have reduced certainly since um, September by around 30, and we hope to continue to do so uh, and, rep and, and replace those with, with uh, agency staff. On our non pay, which includes uh, packages of care as well as uh, various other items of non pay, they, that remains a, a significant pressure for us still. Um, and because of uh, the work that has to be done in renegotiating contracts, before we see the benefit of that, it will take us some months into next year before we begin to see the benefit of renegotiating a lot of contracts where we have found opportunities, uh, the large contracts. The numbers remain that as a month 10, 16 million overspent against uh, non pay against budget, the forecast year end overspent will be at 17.6 as we have predicted before. It's spread across various care groups. But just as a reminder to board, the main drivers of that have been uh, mental health off island placements, social care packages, mainly price differences as well as uh, activity differences, tertiary care contracts, um, uh, we, we think of uh, uh, mainly with the NHS, uh, as well as uh, companion travel costs, which is a policy decision that gave us a significant cost pressure, and estates compliance costs. Those are the big hitting items. The ones we can do something about, of course, are renegotiating all the contracts, as I've just described, and there is a lot of work going on to do so, but this year we'll just have to swallow a lot of the pressures that have come our way, uh, uh, but uh, to benefit next year as we begin to get control of the contracts and their price variations as well as the activity spent uh, on that. Finally, on, uh, on income, before I move on to the reserves position and the financial recovery plan, uh, on income we have, we will overachieve slightly by about half a million pounds, which is in the context of uh, underachieving on surgical private patient income because of the lack of beds. However, we have been able to more than mitigate that by additional overachievement in uh, staff accommodation through the chief nurse budget, uh, as well as some of the long-term care benefit uh, that we've received because of the additional activity we've done. Um, um, so we will have achieved uh, by about half a million on income. Before I move on to the reserves position and the financial recovery plan, as well as the budget planning update, let me just pause at that for any questions. Thank, thanks, Obi. You are indeed a rare beast, an optimistic accountant. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, any questions for Obi? Tony. Yeah, thanks very much for that, uh, oh, oh, be it's much, uh, much appreciated, very understandable, I do like that, the way that you express it to a non-finance uh, person, really. And it, it, overall, it feels very encouraging. I guess the, um, from an operational perspective, I guess it's whether we're confident that, uh, about understanding the impact uh, on, the, on the, the quality and quantity of the services that we actually provide, because um, it's very hard to keep these things in sync, really. And um, I know the board is committed to, uh, as you keep saying, share openness and transparency about what it is that we're uh, that we're doing, which includes the risks and the unforeseen consequences. Make it trying to anticipate as best we can. So, without going on, is this anything about kind of you know operational impact, really, that so that, that, that the directors might want to? So I'll just I'd pick up, because you're absolutely right, you know, one of the key things is, and we've always said with financial recovery, it's a quality-driven financial recovery programme, and you know, in general principles, if you get the quality right, your costs come down. If you get it right the first time for a patient, it's better than getting it wrong and doing it twice and having the, the problems of patient care and indeed finance. I think one of the things that we do do for those schemes that have the potential for a clinical impact. We do a quality impact assessment, and, and certainly the director is responsible, and the medical director and chief nurse are very much engaged in that because we want to ensure that what we do doesn't have a negative impact. And I think this year, 
um, has been, I would hate to say re easy, but relatively easy. The real challenge we're going to get now, and I think Obi will probably pick this up, Obi, won't you, in the, the budget setting process, is um, what our position is going to be like in 2024 and what difficult decisions um, uh, inevitably, I was going to say may need to be made, but I would say inevitably need to be made about clinical services. Um, and, and that's obviously a piece of work that hasn't been completed yet and ongoing. And our aim is to ensure that we protect clinical services during the course of 2024. But, you know, as we go through it, we still have a significant gap of services that, for example, who have had non-recurrent funding in the past uh, given to us by government, that funding disappears uh, at the beginning or part way through 2024. So there's some difficult discussions that we're currently having in the senior leadership team with the, obviously, the, the chiefs of service, the medical leaders of the, the uh, individual services about how we, we manage that. So I think from this year, we maintain that. So the, the whole issue around the quality impact assessment for next year is part of the budget setting process. But there's no point pretending, as you say, you know, the transparency around this. It is going to be really quite difficult next year, knowing that the position that we're in about what services um, we can provide and which ones we can't, quite frankly. And, and those discussions are obviously ones that would need to happen with politicians. Um, before we got to anywhere close to making decisions on that, but there's certainly no point pretending that next year isn't going to be um, a very difficult one for us. Okay. Thank you. Just to assure my colleagues that will come back to the board. Yes. So when the deliberations have taken place and decisions have to be made and the discussions with the politicians have occurred, that will come back to the board in the public domain. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. I, I don't ever understand money, even though I'm a GP. Don't say. But uh, thank you very much, Obi, because this is the clearest finance uh, report I've ever seen. I'm sort of reminded of the previous conversation that we had about unnecessary surgical procedures, and I'm sure there'll be other unnecessary procedures, and I'm not just picking up the surgeon, but, and that the fact that the agency overspend uh, is amounts for medical and service medical and surgical services, which I assume are doctors and nurses, uh, in terms of overspend, comes to eleven million pounds. So I just wonder whether we, when we do this deep dive, because if it's a choice between critical services or looking at what's actually being done, because I'm also minded that income underachievement is there. So we've got these two mismatches. We've got an enormous overspend in medical and surgical. I assume clinical staff and enormous underachievement in the same spaces. So it, it, there's a sort of mismatch, and the only thing in my mind I can think is that, and I hate using this word, but the productivity needs to be looked at because, and I'm not saying that because patients are adequates of activity, but if there's something not right as a as a real naive person looking at this, and I'm not saying to discuss it here, but I. If, if it's a choice between a two-year waiting time to get your glaucoma sorted versus looking at doing an extra operation a day, I'm sure the public in Jersey will make a, a choice, as will your politicians. So it's just something that I'm sure, that as a board member, we're going to be looking at over the years. But I just wanted to say that, and thank you, Obi, for making this so easy to, to look at. I think the answer to your question goes yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, the product... Yes. Just, to, just to, to stress that the issue of productivity is crucial here. And, and I was going to pick up that point, uh, so you're absolutely right in your observation. It is one of the drivers that we identified when we did the FRP work, is apart from some of the structural issues we identified around funded services, as well as the historic recruitment issues in attracting people to Ireland, but we also then identified areas of where things are entirely in the control of HCS and productivity was definitely one of them. But if, whilst I, 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 I know most clinicians do not like that word, I mean, maybe we should invent another word for it, but it is, it is rooted in evidence because if we use benchmarking and experience to define, for example, theatre's efficiency and lost time within that, or patient flow and where all the delays are in a pathway, those are the clinical and operational inefficiencies, which also, uh, I think, was alluded to before, 
um, that actually we are tackling through this process. So the money is simply an expression of the journey that happens and how much money gets spent in treating patients and the quality of care that's delivered at the end of it. It just measures that. And of course, what the FRP is doing is simply saying, if we do that better, more efficiently, not only do we improve the quality of care, operational performance, but actually we can release the money to either spend and reinvest in growing services or save it to do other things. And that is the whole basis of what the FRP is built on. So productivity, in my view, actually is a absolutely the correct way to drive quality and improvement. Um, and the money simply is, going, is measuring that. Um, if I move on to the reserves... Thank you, Obi. I think Simon just wants to comment. No. Yeah, it, it was really just to make a few additional points, because obviously uh, Kath and I from the clinical side of the team working very closely with Obi on this, because the points you make are, are right. Not to go into the detail, but what has driven the productivity problem particularly is that we've got too many medical patients in surgical beds because of, and then let's not go into detail about why that is, but it's just a fact, uh, which has then resulted in impact on surgical services. And it all sounds very abstract, but what it actually means is that fewer people are getting treated and more people are in hospital when they shouldn't be in hospital. So it's kind of, you know, it's a lose lose. So very happy to have a discussion offline about yeah, the, the, the plans that we are developing to deal with that. We, we look at it because it's a small hospital, so they, even if they're in the wrong bed, it's not a long way to go to theatre. So I think it's not to discuss it, it's just something yes. that there is an absolute <coughs> trade off, as Obi said, between not using effectively your, your theatres and having somebody go blind. It's an absolute, you know, end to end. So and, that, not, yeah. and, and that's the end where we come to it, is that this isn't ultimately about the money, it's about making sure that patients get treatment, yeah. which, is what, which is the reason for efficiency. Obviously, we need to live within our means, but we need to treat as many patients as well and as quickly as possible. So we're very happy to discuss that work. This is the, the core work we're doing really. All that emphasises the point that poor productivity equals poor patient care. This is absolutely about the care of patients. Yeah. Tony. Thank you, Chair. Just one uh, quick comment. I know we're we keen to move on, really. I mean, going back to what you were saying at the start about the assurance committees, I mean, what we're saying about this imbalance of where the funding is going really underlines the need for a focus on commissioning um, and a, a clear foundation. What is it that the people of Jersey are going to want and need? in five, ten years time and how do we um, over time work with providers to put those things um, um, in place. So I just wanted to relate the finance discussion back to what you were saying at the start. Indeed, thank you for that. that and that is absolutely why we're establishing that assurance committee and why I'm confident that the two non-executives that are going to co-chair it will drive improvement. Thank you. Can I just, um, it leads on from that, because I've also scribbled down commissioning as a comment. Um, and I think we've, we've had reference already twice in, in this meeting to the issue of um, delayed transfers of care. Um, and obviously the, the hospital doesn't function if it has an outflow and it hasn't got beds available for all the issues we've been talking about. Um, the solution to delayed transfers of care rests in the community and it rests with care homes and it rests with care in the home. Um, neither of which we can directly resolve ourselves, but we do have a key part to play in it. And I think one of the things we do need to think about how we put into this agenda at some point is our relationships and work with the, the care sector and the third sector, but also with other government departments, because the issue of not being able to discharge is related to the lack of capacity in those sectors. And those sectors lack capacity because they haven't got staff. And they can't get staff because they can't pay them the right rates. And that's actually a, a problem that's in the UK as well. Yeah. But if government in general doesn't come together to look at that issue and care of older people in general, we are always going to have these problems in the hospital. Yeah. And they're not resolvable just by us sitting around this table. Yeah. Um, so I think at some stage we have to broaden that out. I think the commissioning assurance group provides a place to start to collect some of that Indeed. information to, to take it out to other places. Indeed. So we look forward to a report from that Assurance Committee on this particular <laughs> issue, Absolutely. which we're agreed is crucial. Obi, back to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just on the reserves position, I thought it would be worth clarifying how the reserves in uh, the um, uh, in HCS and, and, and Treasury in Government of Jersey work. 
But it, it, each, each, our reserve position at the moment uh, is 1.67 million, as at year end is what we are forecasting would be left. Now, it is worth clarifying from the last discussion we had that the, the way the reserves work in Government Jersey and, 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 and the HCS and the individual organisation is slightly different to a traditional model where we would expect each organisation to build its own reserves uh, rather than you have centrally. In, in, the, in, in the model that we operate here in Treasury, all reserves are held centrally by Treasury and individual organisations then bid for that or apply for that based on need on a case-by-case -case basis and those are considered as a well. And so the reserves that I refer to of what remains were the, uh, the need for using additional funding that was applied for at the beginning of the year which we were given. Uh, and they include growth reserves, COVID reserves, and capital reserves, uh, or additional funding, if you like. And we draw against those depending on need. Uh, and, and as we go through that, that's what I mean about 1.67 being left. What it does not mean that if we run out of money, that we don't have any reserves to fall back on, because the ultimate banker of last resort here is Treasury, and Treasury holds the reserves, risk reserves for each individual organization. And so the process of each month updating and doing the forecasts and putting those into Treasury effectively allows Treasury to be able to maintain sufficient levels of reserve to um, fund organize, uh, the individual organizations as needed. So it, it, it was important to clarify that point as I think we um, uh, it is different to where each individual organizer builds a reserve hot to mitigate itself. It is working with Treasury where it's centered, where it's happened, where it applies for. Um, also to say, just to remind the board that we did use until uh, uh, last report, 3.1 million or all of those reserves have been used. We will further be using the remaining 1.67, so we'll use all of them uh, to mitigate one of our cost pressures position, uh, as well as just deliver our 26 million. So apart from delivering savings, because of cost pressures that I have mentioned in not pay as well as in some of the substantive recruitment not replacing agency has meant that we are using these reserves to mitigate that to hold our position at 26 million um, which uh, as I've described I can remain optimistic that we will be able to deliver by the end of this year. Uh, finally the risks uh, remain the same as I reported last time uh, which is recruitment to substantive post not, 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 not replacing agency uh, 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 tertiary care contracts, month and month placement, social care placement in terms of the price variations, uh, 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 and, 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 and those remain. Uh, the FRP recovery plan, which is really our mitigation going into not only this year's uh, 3 million, which is a million pound a month, was our challenge. Uh, as I said, we, we launched uh, by the time we finished the FRP, it was September, so we really had October, November, December, three months to deliver 3 million. It's a million a month. And as I've described, I think I am cautiously optimistic we will deliver that uh, this month, uh, which will, uh, from an HCF point of view, very important in terms of its credibility with Treasury. But what it also does is provide confidence in town that we can do this uh, 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 and for the start that we can do this. However, next year is the big challenge. And I think whilst it is good to be able to say we can deliver 3 million this year, it's a relatively um, it's a relatively um, small number compared to the 12 million we need to deliver for next year, I mean, uh, uh, and there are significant risks that still remain in terms of our capacity capability to do so, making sure that our recruitment comes in at the right time and agency gets replaced, our contracts, especially all those non-pay contracts, the large contracts that I mentioned, we renegotiate and we tend to them whilst uh, keeping some of the unexpected cost pressures that have hit us this year at bay for next year. Hopefully we'll get that right going forward. Um, so a lot, lot, so lot of work to yet be done and, uh, uh, for next year's plan, but we exit this year hopefully on a, on a positive note. Finally, on budget planning, uh, as Chris has mentioned, that remains one of our, is progressing at pace uh, for 24, as uh, the board will remember, we agreed a budget with Treasury, an increased budget at rate of 286.5 million for next year, which included additional funding for unfunded, 15 million pounds of unfunded services, as well as the deficit that we were 
we're raising 26 million for this year. Um, there are a um, that budget uh, funding pro, uh, uh, um, cycle is due to complete at the end of the month. We have significant challenges because we are seeing a lot of cost pressures uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, in the initial uh, budget cycle that we've gone through with the care groups and the executive, executive team are now working very closely together with the care groups to try and balance that to fit the funding available within the budget envelope. It is a significant challenge at the moment and it will take a number of budget iterations to go through it, but we will follow a very robust process to do, make sure that services are protected, um, but the budget's the budget and we have to fit within that. And I just wanted to highlight that saying it's going, to, it's going to be a real challenge to hit the deadline to get that done by the end of this month, but it's one that we have to do. Um, I'll stop at that and take any, any further questions. I think there'll be anything further from Obi. Obi, thank you very much. Um, so, should we have a 10 minute comfort break? Um, 10 minutes only. Yeah. I think the floor is yours, Steve, isn't it? Thank you, Chair. Um, Chris mentioned in his uh, initial report some of the things I was going to highlight, so I won't go through the, the increase in staffing costs or, or the VHC rates and stuff that's already been covered by Chris. A couple of the things that I did want to cover, uh, just uh, put brought to your attention, is that turnover rate remains stable at around 4%, which is around 100 people leaving in a 12-month period. And the sickness rate remains stable around just over 5%, 5.5% five for the last few months as well. So we're not seeing any increase in either of those key indicators as well. Something else I wanted to pull to your attention is the, the first publication of a pipeline of sorts. So the team will be working hard to gather information manually on our recruitment activity. And what you have in the paper today is the first uh, pipeline and relating specifically and only to nurses at this point in time. Uh, we're looking at we're doing the same for other staff groups, but it gives it, uh, the board and also the exec an idea of the activity that's ongoing in the recruitment um, fields around nursing. And it's relatively healthy over the next few months. If you factor in that turnover for nurses over the last two, 12 months has been one or two nurses per month, and we're bringing in 25 every quarter, you can see that we are bringing in more than we are losing and that will lead into that vacancy um, issue that we have as well. And then the final piece of the paper for the first time this month is around Connect. Connect is a, is a, a whole new suite of modules around staff um, recording information and managers recording information, uh, recording of manager training, recording of appraisals and, and objectives, as well as making your own changes on your own data and information, and ultimately leading to a, a, an automated recruitment process as well. And that's rolled out through this year, which will lead to efficiencies in automation and how staff and managers manage staff and staff manage their own information. Um, I think everything else is, is as read, so I'm happy to take any questions or anything. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Judy? Um, I'll, I'll talk about it. <laughs> Thank you for the paper. I think it's really helpful to have that suite of information. Um, the one thing I thought would enhance it, I don't know how easy it is to do it, is whether you can get any comparative information. Because looking at it, I don't know whether a 4% turnover is really yeah. good, or it's actually not very good at all. Yeah. Um, I think the easiest is to benchmark against other departments in the states, but if we could get some other information from health organisations, yes. it would really start to bring to life those numbers. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so from my, from my experience in talking this through with Chris as well, the turnover rate of 4% is, is remarkably low. Yeah. Yeah. And in some ways, it's worryingly low. Very, it's yeah. very low. It's you might want to do it in the time. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say I think you know benchmark with the organisations I've led in the NHS. Four percent is incredibly low. Yeah, um, and and it's not a surprise, is it's it? Really, to be yeah, on the yeah, yeah. So, um, but I think the thing that was interesting to me is that we're actually we're certainly recruiting far more people than we're mm. we're losing. Um, and uh, and as Steve said, you know, we're talking about losing about two nurses. One or two nurses on average every month. Every month, which is, I say, percentage is very low. So <clears throat> we're not seeing, you know, I, I would expect some of the organizations, I would, would have a turnover rate that would be three, yeah. three times, yeah. like maybe That's four about, times. Yeah. About 10, 10 to 12%. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, but that's what usually regardless of ideas. Yeah. Without comparative data, we wouldn't necessarily have this conversation. Yeah. Just yourself, that's what yeah. Fact, I'm, I'm happy. No, to, I yes. No, I, I, I take the point, and it, it's a point well made. And there's all, as Chris has alluded, the island nature of, of mm. here, I think, is, accounts for that. Yes. People not leaving, who may have left if they had another organisation that they could go to. Um, and you know, people come here, get settled, and stay mm. more as well. So what it, what it looks like is you know that that one to three years is is the uh, so a lot of this data is coming through. So you'll start seeing this evolve as we get more and more detail. But one to three years, if if people stay beyond that, then they stay. They stay. But that's that's a trend in all employment, not just here, and not just in health. Mm. You know, the new generations do two to three years somewhere and then move on, and we need to get used to that and so forth. Okay, Steve. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so the second paper is just a, a, a just a way of just capturing and uh, the board asked last month for what's going to be our long-term approach. It's not a strategic document. It's a list of the activities that we've engaged in over the last 12 months or so to change the way that we recruit and to, to assure the board that you know we are trying multiple different strands. I think we've proven there isn't one single magic bullet that's going to fix this. We have to go into different ways for different markets and different staff groups and different age groups and demographics and the inclusivity that Tony and I talked about previously and, and we'll get back to talking about as well. Um, but what the, So there's a whole series of different approaches we're taking and there are in place now some oversight and governance groups which will ensure that the activity is actually happening, that managers are moving through with their recruitment process in a timely fashion, that they are triggering it in a timely fashion. Previously, we didn't have any sort of data or control over that. Connect will give us some oversight of when someone resigns and when the actual recruitment activity starts and then manage the various timelines through it, as well as the different fields in which we go to uh, advertise and, and, and attract. And our retention offer around recruitment and retention for bonuses and the refer a friend scheme are all designed to widen our net of um, attraction. Thank you, Steve. Anything on that? Can I just ask yeah. a question about the OSCE? Yes. Um, I mean, I understand what you've said in the paper, I understand what the problem is. I, I just wondered if, um, I mean, clearly other islands like Guernsey and the Isle of Man must have this problem as well. Well, they don't because they can use the NHS. And why can they use it when you can't? We, we, we well, I don't know for sure what the, the legislation around that is, but they are, the Isle of Man, we went to an organisation that supports the Isle of Man. And I don't know if it's because the Isle of Man has some connection and which the NHS and is seen as part of, and we are not. Yeah. So well, Guernsey we, doesn't. Guernsey's exactly. Right. So I haven't, yeah, I'm haven't checked in with, with, with Guernsey about Oski, but certainly we, we tried to look at um, the Isle of Man model, mm -hmm. and we got into issues around employment and, and who right. who had people in residency here because they had to spend 12 weeks in uh, in the UK to do Oski because they couldn't right. do it here. This week, as it happens, I've just had a conversation with external relations about is there ways we can get around this? Mm. And they're trying to come up with creative ways of, of, of contracting people so they don't need to have the residency here. Mm. And that might help us. So it's not a closed door, it's no. just not a short term. Well, <laughs> so we, uh, we read a little bit like we've looked at it, it can't be done. No, so it's more, um, yeah, so it's, it's on the, it's on the we're still working at it yeah. for a longer term fix. We need either partner with an organisation. Mm. Um, in, 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 a, in a proper contractual way, which, which which helps the employee as well as us, or the external relations offer of, of maybe there's a way you can have a contract and work and live in the UK for a period of time, or which would help. Or any way to piggyback off whatever Guernsey are doing yeah. if they've managed to crack it. Yeah, and I, and I don't know if Guernsey have cracked it. It's one of the things that might well be improved if Jersey had a much clearer relationship with a single organisation in the UK. Mm -hmm rather than trying to have relationships with endless different organisations. Um, that, that's all work in progress. Mm. Yeah. Anything else? So, Patrick, job planning. And in particular, perhaps you could pick up the relationship between job planning and productivity, back to where we were. Yeah, so obviously this is a monthly report and I'll take it as read. I think what has uh, changed in the last month is that we have uh, engaged support from two allocates, uh, job planning <coughs> experts uh, who both have an HR background, both have significant experience in, in medical staffing uh, and 
suffering not significantly, significant way through our job plan. It gave us the opportunity to review the job plans that have been signed off in terms of quality, really, and consistency. And I also need to acknowledge uh, uh, Professor McKenzie's input to that process as well. I think everyone came to the same conclusion that there were significant uh, discrepancies, lack of consistency uh, in, in all sorts of areas. For example, um, just how different activities are recorded, same activities being recorded in, in different ways, lack of clarity around what core uh, program activities are, um, lack of consistency in the way that's on call um, and uh, additional work is recorded within job plans. Um, so we took the decision in collaboration with our LNC colleagues to pause any more second sign-off or signing of any more job plans until we had a, a more structured approach. Um, our initial ambition was really just to understand where people were and what they were doing. Um, but as I say, I think that has led us to a point where um, that approach really wasn't good enough. Um, so we have paused it. Our colleagues are working with the care groups, with the clinical leads, with the, the chiefs of service um, to support them in understanding the system. It's very clear. Whilst we have a policy that we're all comfortable with, it wasn't being implemented uh, consistently. Um, so we want to include far more information within the job plans, getting back to that point around productivity. Um, that wasn't being recorded and obviously job planning is a discussion between the organisation and the individual so whilst we want to put in those um, objectives for colleagues we also need to understand why that may not be possible what they need from us as an organisation and that needs to be recorded within those job plans. So our aim is to um, complete the job planning for the people who hadn't completed it, <coughs> but also go back through all the job plans for the people who had had that second sign off, and the paper describes the order in which we're going to do that. It was coming through a bit ad hoc of a couple of people from a department, so we want to do it department by department because that makes a lot more sense. Um, and we aim to have that piece of work completed by the end of March next year. And hopefully with the, the, the inputs, um, what I think we recognise is there needs to be a lot more support for, for clinical leads and types of service to do the job planning and that training needs to take place. And hopefully with these colleagues that will leave a legacy um, so that uh, moving forward everyone within the organisation has a much better understanding of, of, of how we go about it and, and what's required. Thank you Patrick. Any questions for me? Claire. Can I just ask a simple question? Job planning is usually done at the annual appraisal. Do possibly do the doctors and nurses get, um, and I don't mean an annual regulatory appraisal, I mean an annual job planning performance related appraisal. Is that in place in Jersey? So, did you say the relationship between the, the, the medical appraisal and the job plan? No, there's Confusion sometimes between appraisal that's requiring for revalidation, yeah. which is a job planning appraisal, yeah. versus a job planning appraisal which is looking at your work and, and yeah. that's usually done at an annual review. Is that something? I think, I think the short answer to your question is no, it's not done. Um, is that all now? No? Hello, hello? Okay, slide shut the speaker. I don't want to get into prolonged debate about appraisal, but essentially medical appraisal, which supports the revalidation of doctors, is a developmental process um, based on the thesis that if you reflect on your practice, your practice will improve. That's quite different from the normal appraisal that you see in organisations, which is essentially a performance management process. I think that's what you're alluding to, Claire. Um, and that does not take place in Jersey. So the, the, cha the initial challenge in Jersey is to get Jersey up to speed with, with, with where it should have been many years ago, to be frank, and to get that process in place which supports revalidation because medical practitioners here have to be revalidated by the GMC. The next issue might be the performance management issue. 
and that would have a more direct effect potentially on productivity than the current appraisal process. But, but I think, I guess my view on this has been let, let, let's do the first thing first and, and come to the more politically contentious one second, given the obvious difficulties of getting to the first base. Does, does that begin to answer your yeah, question? Yeah. yeah. That's very helpful. That's okay. very helpful. Thank you. Anything else for Patrick on job planning? Good. Thank you very much. So, Claire, when to plan? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll take the paper as read. I think the key things to highlight are that we reviewed our winter period last year uh, and ensured that we've learned from, from what, what happened last year and what went well and what we want to improve on. We've also looked elsewhere to see key areas of focus uh, and considerations in terms of good winter planning, which we've done. Um, we have the additional physical estate this year of 28 beds with the recently refurbished Plumont Ward. Of course, we all need to um, ensure that we have adequate staffing levels, and obviously I'll continue to work closely with, with Jesse, um, and obviously planning is ongoing in relation to deploying our own staff uh, but also with the use of temporary staff. I think the risk um, around the additional finances that could be required to surge, uh, which is obviously part of normal winter planning, um, have, have been mitigated well this year uh, with the additional uh, beds that have been put online for medicine as part of the work that we're doing responding to the Royal College of Physicians acute medicine re um, report. So that gives us a good grounding, but of course we will still be reliant on uh, additional staff. Uh, so we have processes in place to ensure that staffing levels are safe. Um, we've got key pieces of work being taken forward by our medical services care group in relation to the development of our same day emergency care service, uh, which will be key, and also the development of an ambulance handover area uh, in our ED. So we've got some mini estates work just going to deliver that area, um, and that's been a really uh, good collaborative piece of work between health and community services and Jersey Ambulance Service, so that we can ensure that we're doing our part to uh, ensure that the ambulances are, are back on the road as soon as possible. Obviously, we're looking at our operational flow processes. Uh, we've had some further training around red to green, uh, and that we're now in a position to use elements of our uh, new EPR to help us to capture that data, data uh, and drive improvement with that. Um, obviously, I continue to work closely with Andy in relation to uh, a weekly detox meeting where we review uh, patients to ensure that they're accessing onward care as soon as possible um, and the development of a discharge to assess pilot. Um, I don't know whether there's any further questions or comments from Andy in relation to mental health, but it's laid out in the plan. And I would like to take uh, this opportunity to thank both our, our clinical and non-clinical staff, particularly with the refurbishment of Plumont Ward and Beaufort Ward this year. Um, and of course, um, that's obviously on top of the day job. So having to move wards uh, as we still uh, deliver our key services every day. Uh, so thank you know, all the teams for the very hard work in relation to bringing that additional capacity online for this winter. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. So questions for Claire? Tony. Mm. Yes, yeah, can, can I ask you what uh, work we do in preparing the independent health care and um, homes for potential winter pressures. Just an open question, really. Yeah, so there are, there are some meetings with providers. Um, the, the commissioning folk meet collectively, periodically, with the, with the system um, to talk about that. And then there's a, a wider contextual um, framework, which is in relation to changes that the government are making around long-term care, um, they've announced an inflationary increase of 7.7% this next year. So that you know the, the wider stuff goes on, but we have direct conversation. The, the, the weekly detox meetings, I think, are immensely helpful. You know, we've now got a really clear data set week on week of why people are delayed, how long they're delayed, and what they're waiting for. And it's moved. It's moved in the last three months. You know, so so we've seen a, a quite a change in providers providing packages of care more quickly. That's in part, I think, going to be further helped by the new brokerage system that CLS has introduced for us. Um, but, but today, the key reasons that people are waiting are access to nursing home beds and access to residential beds. The vast majority are nursing home beds. There's a small number of those who are waiting for very specialist beds for people with dementia. But there's no doubt at all. There's other things that we can do to bridge the packages of care issue 
but we've got to stimulate the market or have a different conversation about nursing homes and access to dementia care because that's the thing at the moment that is causing us the, the biggest delays by far. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on winter? Good. Serious untoward incidents. I'm not sure the second one. So I'll take the paper as read. I think Chris has covered quite a few of the points that I was going to make in his uh, um, paper. Um, the position, I think, is improving. We absolutely recognise there's a very, very long way to go with this. Um, I think what is encouraging um, is around the safety huddles that are taking place in a much more timely way than uh, they were previously. Um, I think maybe pick up the point on massive obstetric hemorrhage here. So um, absolutely we are very concerned about the rates of both PDA and that obviously leading on to massive obstetric hemorrhage. For that reason every MOH uh, comes to the serious incident review panel that's held on a weekly basis. Again, I think what's encouraging is that uh, of the last nine at the con, seven have not been declared as SIs. Um, and what we've seen is that the, there is um, the escalation uh, of concerns uh, is, is being acted on much earlier. Uh, and the management of that uh, massive obstetric hemorrhage, uh, putting out the call earlier, getting all the right people in the room, that has been taking place. So, so, so that is good. Um, we are obviously getting a schematic review done by an independent uh, company, which I think is starting very soon. Um, and what we really want from that is to understand why we might be in the position of having those MOHs in the first place. I'm clearly not uh, an expert in obstetrics. Um, however, my understanding is that the way that labour is managed can have a significant impact PPH and MOH. I'm very aware that Kathy might still be on the call, who has a lot more knowledge in this area than myself, but I think that's what we really want to understand next, so that uh, hopefully that will lead to a reduction. Whilst we can manage it very well now, um, we want to get to a position where there is uh, these things occur much less frequently. Kathy, probably. Yeah. Kathy, should we deal with this on the maternity improvement paper, or do you want to speak to it now? I'm happy to go with what works best with the board, Chair. Well, let, let's deal with it under the maternity paper, shall we? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Anything for Patrick? Yes, Chair. Um, I'm really pleased to see that we're getting on top of the process issues. It is, it is always difficult to find enough investigators and to, to get that moving. But I suppose my question is more about um, how you take the assurance and you can reassure us that the learning is embedding not just within particular area that, that the SIs come through, but if there's organisational wide learning, how well that's being embedded. Because my recollection was that was the hardest part was being certain that traction was gained on embedding and change of practice. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. Um, I think we haven't been able to give that assurance. I'm, I'm not sure we could give as much assurance as we would like. Uh, we have, however, in the last few months had uh, support from uh, an initiatives team, Quality Improvement, uh, and uh, one of her members of team now sits within the Quality and Safety team, and th that's exactly what she's doing in the graph on the uh, last page of the report. She's looking through all the recommendations, seeing uh, which have been implemented, looking for uh, robust evidence that it has actually been implemented, and we are seeing um, a number of open recommendations decrease, but I, I, I think we've still got a lot to do in terms yeah, there, of... There is a resourcing issue around this, because one of the things that would help that further is if that check was then done again in six months and a year, and because and sometimes things are fed and then they're signed, then it yeah. fades again. Yeah. And, and, and hopefully we'll get that. The, the quality and safety team has been significantly expanded this year. There's still some posts to recruit to, um, but I would hope that moving into next year will start to be able to give uh, much more assurance. Yeah, thanks for that. I think what's important about that is, is that there's a move here to look at compliance. 
Yes, it refers back to our previous discussion, doesn't it? Which is, you set out to do something, do you know you're doing it or not? So I'm really encouraged to hear that, that this is clearly actively being pursued. And at some point, it would be good to hear back here what the results, when they've looked at compliance, what have they found? Yeah. So could you bring that back um, at some convenient point? Probably going to be February, I yes. think. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Would that be helpful? That would be really helpful. Right. And Thank you. Your second point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. I, was, I was quite interested to see the reference to ambulance services and children's services, and that this department has a responsibility um, from a clinical governor's perspective, I assume, around investigating SIs in, in those areas. But I just wondered, because it is such a difficult place to get resources to, to do those investigations, are you able to draw on capacity within ambulance services and children's services to lead on and do and support these investigations? Uh, to be fair, there aren't that many of them. Um, so, uh, I think... Uh, yeah. Well, I think we would certainly insist upon it. I would expect, expect it. Um, but you, you're quite right, it is difficult when you don't have the um, operational responsibility to start. And, and I would wonder where the responsibility lies when you've completed that review. Yeah. There's a set of recommendations. They have to be implemented in areas that are not our responsibility. Um, and how that gets seen through and where the, the level of responsibility and accountability sits for that. Because it is quite unusual for those services not to be within a health environment, mm. particularly ambulance. Yes. Sorry, I'm stating your opinions. No, no, I didn't think... I, I, well, certainly my hesitation was to what extent we wanted to pursue this, because oh, yeah. I, think, I think we're agreed that, that it, it's, it's unusual, to yeah. say the least those services are placed where they are. I, I can't think that helps anybody, yeah. but I guess this is a governmental issue. Um, and I, I suppose what I'm reflecting on is should, should we as a board raise that with the minister, yeah. our, our, our concern? Because essentially, we're, we're not quite clear for that which we account, are we? We're not, and I'm also wondering whether in fact there is enough identification of SIs in those services. In, indeed. Can we take that away and think about it? And perhaps we could come back to you and, and discuss it further. Because it, I, I can absolutely see there's potential here for a, ma a major issue. Yes. Um, with a lack of clarity about who is doing what. Mm -hmm. we'll, we will come back, yeah? On that part. Right, thank you. Anything else for, yes? Sorry, Chair, can I just check? Cathy, you did have your hand up. Yes, it was in response, I think, Patrick, when we were looking at how we gain the benefit as part of the maternity cycle, we've introduced a 30, 60, 90 day feedback to ensure those actions that were embedded with a view to bringing a quarterly paper through Hammond 13 to ensure that those actions remain and remain true. And we've seen this evidence from maternity. So, really to assure the board and Patrick and the team that this is work very much in progress and, and we're seeing the green shoots of it in the maternity plan starting that 30, 60, 90 day cycle, following into a quarterly cycle, which then carries on to ensure embeddedness. Thank you, Cathy. Anything else? For Adrian. Oh, Sorry? Yes. Adrian, well, Adrian's been to the board before. Do you want to just introduce yourself um, oh, yeah. again and, and then tell us about acute medicine? Yeah, of course. Uh, so, my name is Dr. Adrian Newton. I'm the Chief of Service of Medicine. Um, oh, I am an IME. I think at the, at the last board meeting, you wanted us to talk to you a little bit more about the medicine plan. So, You asked us to come and talk to you a little bit more about the medicine improvement plan. Um, so uh, at this meeting we've brought you a sample of some of the actions that were involved in that. Uh, this has come out of the invited review from the Royal College of Physicians. Uh, there were some immediate actions which we needed to uh, undertake, um, which we completed. Um, some of the more detailed and, and in-depth actions we are still in progress on, but we've summarised it in, in the uh, table that you've got there in your paper. Um, we've got um, some really big pieces of work to do in this, to, along with culture, uh, governance, um, as well as education. Um, we 
retention of staff. There's some fairly big meaty chunks in it. Um, I'm really happy to, to take questions on uh, areas of it. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Adrian. And I think just to, to open me, obviously this is a monthly, <coughs> a monthly paper. Um, obviously at the time of the paper being produced, I think it was just under three weeks of the last board. So I think in terms of recommendations, there may not be many changes to the numbers uh, completed. I think key to supporting the care group is the additional improvement capacity, uh, which is a very experienced um, safety improvement a uh, senior nurse that we have uh, working with us from the UK and she started about a week and a half ago. Um, so I think in terms of further assurance for the board, providing more evidence of completed actions, that's a key area of focus uh, and something that we'll be able to I think, provide a bit more meat on um, uh, next, next month. The key focus of the care group has really been uh, the work that Chris alluded to in his paper uh, in relation to the medical model, which of course we need the substantive clinical leadership and staff to really lead and, and take forward the, the, the change. Um, so obviously that, that is progressing. Um, so I, I think, you know, just to sort of summarise those points, just sort of the important. important thing. Yes, thanks for that. So for next time, I think what would be helpful would be to, to summarise the recommendations of the Royal College report. The bit that I suppose I would be particularly grateful to hear about would be uh, the consultant input into acute medicine um, and are we or are we not seeing a consultant presence on the wards looking after acutely ill patients on a daily basis, which I understand to be what's required. I mean, Simon might want to comment on this, but, uh, but I think I think that would be really helpful if we, if we could set out, this is all been recommended, with, but with a focus on that. So are the clinical staff, both medical and nursing, of sufficient seniority seeing the patient sufficiently frequently? And that has a direct effect not only on patient safety, but of course on, on, on turnover and productivity. Yeah. Yeah? And it links back, I'm sure Patrick will agree, to job planning. Yeah, so when we look at the job plans, is it clear whether or not we've got the correct presence on those wards or not. Now, it may be, and Claire and I were talking informally about this, it may be it'll, it'll demonstrate that we lack the appropriate number of consultants or the appropriate number of nurses. I don't know, but we do need to establish that very clearly because I have a concern that that input is not as robust as it should be. Now, is that fair? If you think I've I got that wrong, tell me. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, we were talking exchanging glances. Um, I don't think colleagues will disagree when I say it's not as it should be. Right. Um, uh, I should also say that this is a really long term problem. It's not something that is new when we've been back through the history of it. Um, I can find a report at least 2014 that said this was a problem. Yeah. A very long term problem. Uh, there is not enough time in consultant job plans to cover the work, which gives Adrian a very difficult position. A lot of the work covered at the moment is by locums. Uh, that causes us multiple problems, one of which is very expensive. Two is, while some stay a good length of time, others do not, which means that it's very difficult for them to get a grasp and continuity of care becomes a problem. Therefore, patients who need a continued presence to move them through the system, don't get that, fall for the trees, etc. So it comes back to what we were discussing earlier about where quality and money interact. So there is a paper currently being developed, quite complicated because it requires Claire's input, it requires Adrian's input, it requires Obi's input for finance, it requires my help and another consultant physician to try to design, to completely redesign the medical model. One thing that will enable that is we have some consultant requirements coming up and we can replace them with different uh, jobs. Uh, the recruitment will be interesting, but we will work on that. So uh, we're, we're having actually a meeting with a consultant specialist advisor from another uh, hospital on one particular specialty on Friday, I think, right? Um, who's kind of coming to visit give us some advice. So it is a problem, it is not fixed, which it was, but there is work going on. I think maybe by the meeting at the end of January, 
we could produce something that would give a more reassuring update um, uh, about the progress that's been made. We're not going to have new consultants imposed by that, and it's not realistic, but, but at least all the work has been done. Would that be but fair? Because I, I, I don't want to sort of kind of have a prolonged discussion that won't really give you anything no, more than that today. No, I suppose what I'm, what I'm asking for is that, I mean, the, as I understand, the college report is on the website, so it's in the public domain. Yeah? The college report, when I read it, I mean, alarmed me, to be clear. As, as I know, it's, yes. it, it's alarmed you and everybody else. So I, for me, I think what would be really helpful in January is at least it being clear what it is that needs to be done. I completely recognise it won't be done by January, and it's not that different to that which was recommended in 2014. Yeah? So, so there's nothing new about this, but the challenge for us is to get it right. Yeah? And a major challenge. So can we at least for January, recognising that the solutions would all will not be in place, but at least be clear what the aspiration of this organisation is to provide modern acute care of our patients. Currently, to be blunt, too much of it is delivered by locums. And that's not to say the locums are not competent at all, but we all know that you don't get consistently good care unless you have substantively appointed consultants and the relevant nursing staff looking after those patients. Currently, we've got to be frank, we don't. So if we can set that out very clearly for January, I think that would be helpful. And then we can monitor it from there on, can't we? Is, is that fair? Well, yeah. I would. Uh, yeah. Uh, Cooper, yeah. I, I would just like to answer that. So yeah. I think this issue, as you've alluded to it already, has been developing over many, many years. And it's, it's rooted in the specialisation of general physicians um, and, and, and an inability that we've had in Jersey to recognise that that is what's happening and, and, and find a sustainable model that will work and be affordable in Jersey. And that, I think, is the piece of work that you're describing because actually we won't be able to fully respond to this review unless we do change the model. And changing the model, it will be expensive but it will be essential. So therefore, it's important that that debate comes here so yes. that we as a board can endorse our support uh, because it will have to play out and go to SB and it will have to go through to the state because it will, it will be a major investment and it will be a necessary investment in the context of needing to save 25 million over the next year. So I, I think it's important in January to have some sense of the timeline. So yes, we won't get the complete solution to what is the new model that we need to have, but I think to understand what, how long it will take to develop that model and what the stages will be of the, of the decision making processes will be really important to, to give us an assurance that we can actually pick it up and conclude it this time. So I would agree with that, but, but, but it, it's, um, you're right, the investment actually will not be as huge as it might be compared to our, compared to budget, it will be compared to budget, but it will, as opposed to spend, because we have a lot of unbudgeted spend in medicine, it's a little part of over spend is going to work. But there will be investment required, so you're right. The other change I think it's worth just highlighting to the board, if I might, is it's quite a major culture change. Because I'm only an advisor here, but my advice would be that what Jersey needs is a good general medical service. The point that Dean Clare made earlier about the English building what well, special services which in the modern day age can effectively be largely contracted out um, and delivered in other ways. But you need a general medical service. When you come in acutely unwell, we need good facilities to provide good care. And the college report is quite clear that's what the focus of the medical unit needs to be. That hasn't been the internal culture of the medical unit for some time. So actually, it's not just that the executive will need your support in the discussion with SEP, they will actually need your support in a culture change which will not be welcomed by all, probably either within or out of the hospital. And I can say that, which others might not wish to say. So it, 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 there are reasons it hasn't happened before. Thank you, Simon. Just a question. Simon, you have our full support, and because I, I think the members of the public here need to get that translated, what you're actually saying is there needs to be support in order to deliver healthcare on the island of Jersey, 
particular acute medical care in a different way in order to make sure that everybody receives safe care when they're acutely unwell, but as well as receiving when they've got chronic morbidities, <coughs> that they receive care that's joined up. Absolutely we support you on that. And, and it will take, and your review comes up in October, I think, you said, that, you know, it'll take 12 to 18 months. This is not something that's come in a hurry. And when I was interviewed for this job, I said I want to make Jersey the best healthcare system in the world because it's got the possibility for that with a, a single island, you know, with committed people. So, absolutely. Thank you. Good. Thank you for that. Thank you for that topic. I, I hope we've been really clear <laughs> and really open about it. So, for next time, if you would, Adrian, uh, yeah. and, um, please be really clear with us in the paper about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Adrian. Maternity Improvement Plan. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, David Hopkins, Chief of Service, was keen to come to present this paper, but he's not here. I'm happy to go ahead and present it. Is, I don't is know. David coming? I'm happy to push this back. But as far as I'm aware, he, he is coming, so I'm just wondering if we can maybe move to item 7. Let, let's move on then and we'll see whether David comes or not. Thank you very much. So infection prevention. Jesse, are you doing that or Patrick? Me. Are you good? Speak it. No, my friend. <coughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, so, yeah. I'll take the um, paper as read. Um, this paper was to concentrate solely on our COVID and flu vaccine numbers that we discussed last month at board. Um, just the key points we were asked about benchmarked um, against other organisations and what our target rate for vaccination of our staff was would be. Um, and we've committed to um, trying to get our vaccination rate up to 75% in line with other UK trusts. Um, we still continue with our campaign, um, which we have a static venue and we have mobile clinics across HCS. So the mobile clinics are across all of the buildings, not just the hospital. Um, we've got regular communication that we're sending out to staff on a weekly basis. We've got information at the staff entrances encouraging staff to um, attend for their vaccines. Um, to date this year, our COVID numbers are in the paper. Um, our flu has increased, um, and these are figures as of the 16th of November from we wrote the paper. The flu uptake has increased to 986 staff, which is 31%, so we've still got quite a bit to go. And our COVID figures were 815 staff, which is 25%. And um, just to note that those COVID figures are up from last year. So at, when we finished vaccination in 2022, our COVID figures were at 14%, so we're already at 25%, but as I say, a lot of work still to do. Um, the paper does note that we were going to end our vaccination often routinely at the end of December. We have now decided to um, extend this into January. Um, and we're currently looking at the middle of January as our extension, but obviously we'll be reviewing that date with the um, vaccination uptake figures. Happy to. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, Just a very brief comment. Thank you very much for that. I know that you don't have jurisdiction over childhood immunisations, but yesterday I found out that 98% of your children have been vaccinated against MMR, which must be the world's best. So I just want, it impacts us, you know, clearly if kiddies get, don't get their MMR, they're going to end up in hospital. So I'd just like to say congratulations uh, to the GPs for doing it. I'm biased, conflict of interest, I'm one. A similar rate in my borough in London is 60%, and we are seeing measles emerge. So you're not going to get measles on the island, which is fabulous. So the MMR is, as we said last night, strikingly good and sadly I think our vaccination rates are worryingly poor is that fair I think there are any clinicians who know more about this than I do as, as an island as an, oh, no, I mean, in the organization oh, in the organization our staff vaccination yes for COVID and flu yeah, seems to me to be a long way to go. yeah 
What, what's the target? 75% reserves at the target of, in line with the UK benchmark. Right. So, so do you have any confidence we'll get there? So I've got a new lead nurse staff for infection yeah. control as well. So I'm speaking to her on Monday thinking that we look at other ways of um, attracting our staff to attend for the vaccination. Right. I've had mine. <laughs> no, I was respectful. <laughs> Can I ask a question about incentives? Because um, I, I remember this from way back, um, and, and I think the idea of getting a copy of tea is obviously not enough of an incentive. And one would like to think that it's enough of an incentive to really doing the right thing yeah. by getting protected, because not only are you protecting yourself, but protecting your patients and your wider family and whatever, whatever. But in terms of incentive, I, I think back in the day we offered a couple of gift vouchers to coincide with Christmas. And that seemed to be quite popular. And although I can't remember what rates we achieved about five, six, seven years ago, it might be worth checking. Take that on because board. it wasn't yeah. expensive. No. I think it was two fifty pound gift vouchers, one in the hospital and one in community mental health. But it did seem to incentivise people to come mm -hmm. and get their jobs. So it might be worth looking at something like that. I will certainly look at it, you know. Thank you very much. And anything else? Good, okay, thank you very much. Surgical rotor. Do you want to have a doctor? Is David arrived? Oh, right, please join us, David. Need a microphone? Kathy's going to make a comment at some point. So, David, please. Sure. Um, so, you obviously you have the paper. Um, just to put this into context, we're continuing with our improvement plan uh, as we previously presented at the board uh, and continue with the same schedule of, um, uh, of, of close executive uh, oversight uh, with weekly meetings. Uh, and, and the brief report that we presented is to sort of highlight uh, our continuing progress in areas of potential um, exceptions uh, and where we are in each of those areas. So I hope this will be fairly self-explanatory and have to sort of take some questions on it. In terms of continuing uh, progress, in turn, the, the, uh, since the paper was, just, uh, was submitted, we made some further uh, closures of individual uh, recommendations and we are progressing through these at that pace. Um, in terms of areas uh, of, of exception to the plan, uh, we are continuing to work on the culture in particular as described here. We have established now uh, multidisciplinary training sessions, particularly around skills and drills, so in particular focusing on the emergency pathways and getting assurance and that all staff are working together effectively in delivery of emergency pathways. And um, that's still there in the, in, in the exception report because we're still moving that forward uh, and we'll hopefully be able to downgrade that as we provide further evidence that that is um, effective and is, is embedded in daily practice. Um, and they're really the, the key points really I want to, we want to raise from this report. Thank you very much. So I, I, I'm speaking personally, my two areas of greatest concern, one we've covered, acute medicine, and this is the second one, maternity. So the two things where I think we have the biggest single clinical risks in the hospital, those would be my two. So thank you, David. Any questions to David on the maternity improvement plan? Kathy? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think the, the key point moving forward with any form of incident is the fact that the ability to report and investigate. And what we clearly have now in Jersey, we have a, a real, real positive move to report any form of incidents in maternity and take them through to um, resolution. Clearly, when we're talking about our um, major obstetric hemorrhage, we do know that that is a um, 
a consequence of high risk pregnancies. And what is the key issue is that they are noted prior to that pregnancy and we have services and principles in place to protect our women and the babies afterwards. And I think as Patrick described earlier in the meeting, we clearly have established that now to the extent that the last major perceptive hemorrhages that were declared were not declared as SIs. Work is ongoing as part of the thematic review, working part of our team nationally to identify if there are any key issues or key themes or trends that we're not picking up on at the moment. So I think the key issue is recognition, the key is prevention and moving forward with women and their families. So I, I think the work in progress is, is, is very clear, placing women at the centre of what we do. But I think the maternity improvement plan has shown that there are actions that need to be undertaken and those actions have been undertaken and there is a process to make sure that we're actually not we're not hitting the target and missing the point there is follow through and also i'd like to commend the maternity service the production of the maternity newsletter bringing everybody because the maternity improvement plan isn't the plan of the division it isn't the plan of the board it's the plan of everybody to keep women and children safe thank you jen Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Just come back to a point of clarification from, from Kathy's points there about the, um, the uh, major obstetric hemorrhage. We are continuing to report all of those through the SI process and uh, to the SI review panel uh, on a weekly basis as they occur. Um, and, and the trigger point is 1.5 litres, which is the standard trigger used in the NHS. But as Kathy's alluding, the, the SI review panel is satisfied. These are actually having been reviewed by the panel before criteria for a SI investigation on the basis that the actual protocol has been you know, fully followed and all the steps to prevent and manage have been appropriately taken place beforehand. So we're following the national guidance? We are following national uh, guidance, local guidance, uh, 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 as was alluded to. We are proactively identifying risk uh, earlier to a much greater degree and acting at a much earlier level to control hemorrhage before it becomes significant. Thank you. Can I yeah. just ask a simple question? Is there always a consultant obstetrician in late 24 hours? So there is a consultant obstetrician available 24 hours. What's they the are of action to get there? Uh, fairly fast. What's so, so uh, first of all, they have to come in from home. Generally speaking, that's within 15 minutes. They are all relatively uh, local, obviously, at hours travel is less of an issue. We have a um, experienced middle grade, um, so-called middle grade doctor on site 24 hours. Um, the consultants are available in the unit until uh, for 12, 30 hours a day and have rapid return. What we do have is rapid triggering of return before there is an emergency. So our protocol now is that all, uh, all, all areas of concern are escalated early. And I know it's a small island, so you've got economies of scale issue. There's about, I calculate, about three births per day. Uh, but I'm just assuming, I mean, the, the, the RCOG guidelines now is, is 24-7 consultant late presence, the, the presence of a consultant on label. I'm assuming you can't meet that because of the fact that you don't have the volume. But, I mean, I was just reflecting on this because a mess up at birth is a mess up for the rest of the life. A mess up at the other end is just a tragedy. And that's what, it, it's not for me to solve, but it struck me, and maybe it's because I've got a conflict, I've just become a grandmother, you know, the baby was saved by rapid consultant obstetricians. 15 minutes is, is but so, so we, reassure So we, are, we have focused very much on escalation and part of the escalation pathway is early notification. So, for example, in the case of, of obstetric hemorrhage, there's, there's now a, a, always a, a triggering pathway of 500, which is way below uh, the, reaching a, 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 a significant event. So, so we, we are really focusing on those patients where there's any early warning of, of immediate issue uh, are being triggered uh, and with recall uh, arrangements in place. So, we, 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 uh, given the constraints or operating around, we, 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 we've, we've maximised the presence of consultants. I'm sorry, one more so. small point. I noticed there's a stillbirth. Those are always reported, or is there not the same reporting mechanism for stillbirths and maternal deaths? Uh, it's fully reported. Thank you.
three or four, uh, both, both internally but locally, but also through the, uh, through the NHS audit processes. That's lovely, thank you very much. So just to make sure that I, that I understand what I, I was saying, <clears throat> the gold standard would be a consultant presence on the unit 24-7. That's the gold standard. And I think what you're saying to us is because of the few births, that's not a practical proposition in Jersey. So that we can't meet that gold standard, to be clear. Yeah. The way we are trying to mitigate it is by having a very low threshold for escalation yeah. so, that, so that senior staff are called in very quickly and to some extent, because it's a relatively small island, they can get there very quickly. Is it, have I understood? That's correct. That correct? I mean, it's what's said that we have very experienced middle grade staff, so the actual the obstetricians who are present at the 24-7. Uh, are quite a high level of training. They are available 24 7. They are 24 7 on site. That's the, that's the registrar equivalent grade, um, what, we, what we describe as middle grade staff. So these are people who have done significant postgraduate or second training. I think the thing's also worth mentioning, isn't David? You know, part of the, the issue about improving escalation isn't just one of process, so, it's one of culture as culture, well. Absolutely. Um, part of the sort of focus on the cultural change that we need to make in maternity, as has been seen in all sorts of maternity issues in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, we're not uh, different to that, and uh, so the, we have to not just ensure that, going back to previous discussion, that there's a process of escalation, is that the culture it's facilitates solid. that in an effective exactly. way. Uh, and we are very much working on, on, on strengthening that. And I just provide assurance of level of training are uh, our so-called middle grade doctors are all uh, accredited in house to work independently. So in that that they have uh, they are directly observed by consultants uh, through a large number of cases before they actually allow to work independently and put on the on call rotor. Um, and we 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 brought into our protocols uh, a consistent theme of early escalation in that all cases where there is any aspects of concern raised either by the middle free staff or by the middle grade doctors, there is an early discussion with the consultant and where appropriate an early return to base, trying to preempt uh, the need for any like sort of last minute attendance. So so I think I think I understand that. So your your approach is early early escalation at all times, low threshold for escalation. Yeah. Uh, an experienced and competent middle grade who are available on site 24 7 mm -hmm. and early escalation from them to consultant staff who are not on site but will, will be on site very quickly. Correct. Is that, that's the, yeah. the bones of it. And I suppose the next question then for us would be um, to what extent can we be assured that that's actually working? I mean, it seems to be the best plan that you could possibly come up with in the circumstances in which in which we operate. But compliance with it is the next step, isn't it? And that we do monitor, um, and, and particularly by exception reporting. So we, we have quite good assurance. Uh, in terms of obviously the cultural aspects, that's something that we are continuing to work on. But we, it's been embedded in all the training uh, around the escalation policy. Good. Given the very high profile of this, David, would it be helpful to, if you were to come back in January and tell us how you feel you're doing with compliance on the plan? We can do. Thank, Thank you very much. Provide some data on, on the escalations when they occur. Thank you. Pat. So, so, absolutely, I think it would be very difficult to reach that gold standard, but I do think there's still, I do think there's still some um, work to be done. Um, I, I think we should we might be able to get closer to it than, than we currently do. I think there are some real challenges <coughs> in the medical workforce uh, in obstetrics and gynaecology because of the training. So it seems to be dividing it into two specialties, uh, people who are purely trained to do obstetrics and those who are purely trained to do gynaecology, and that's going to be another challenge for the island. Um, but I think we need to keep looking at it. We're taking advice from our external advisor as well to what that workforce should look like. 
Thank you, Patrick. Um, yes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to assure the board, as part of the maternity improvement plan, one of those areas that is now light blue does relate to consultant presence and attendance on Labour Ward uh, as a routine, but also in times of emergency. And because there is a log kept of those tough huddles, this is regularly reviewed to actually demonstrate compliance. So whilst this will be coming back to a future board, it be worth of note for the board that currently within the maternity improvement plan, the attendance on labour ward both routinely and in emergency situation is monitored and escalated. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That, that's also reassuring, Cathy. Um, I, I guess without saying this is of, of huge concern to all of us. Inevitably, we're going to work here in Jersey in slightly difficult circumstances because of the very low numbers of births. So it's a small unit, and we've got to be able to demonstrate that we're doing everything we possibly can to make it as safe as possible. So we, we all of our support. Thank you very much. General Sir, Thanks, David. Thank you, David. This is really just an update on where we are in terms of the Royal College uh, review into the uh, emergency general surgery. Um, we have now agreed terms of reference um, and have turned us to the college. Um, and really, we're just waiting for um, dates from the Royal College of Surgeons as to when they can come and, and do that review. Uh, which they just need to find the team and uh, appropriate date. Thank you, Patrick. Just to sort of say, of course, that you know, we've heard from medicine, we've heard from maternity and obstetrics and gynecology and, and general so This is all, there's a theme here, isn't there? And this is about the subspecialising, Julie, you mentioned it, about the ongoing subspecialisation in medicine that actually presents enormous challenges for small jurisdictions such as our own, particularly when covering emergency rotors and I assume that's true of psychiatry as well that this is um, it becomes increasingly difficult um, in small populations small services to um, uh, and do this because doctors are being trained in a very different way than they were 10 years 20 years ago so it, it is a theme in all our services whether they're physicians surgeons or obstetricians that um, we have to consider we have to taking Julie's point, learn from other jurisdictions um, about how they're managing that. And it does bring us um, to the point that we've all mentioned before about the increased need for networks and partnerships with larger centres, um, staff rotations, um, that will ensure that Jersey gets the high quality care that it needs and particularly focuses on those things where we have to provide on island because they uh, are a matter of life and death. Um, so it is a, it's a general theme. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And uh, whilst, of course, Jersey is, is unique and in, a, in some sense a unique situation, in practical terms, it's, it's not that different to many small hospitals in the UK, certainly not, not different to small hospitals where I've worked in Western Australia. So though it's surrounded by sea, it's not, in, it's not actually that different. And the way of dealing with this is well understood. And as you say, Chris, the way you deal with it is by networking these services with major centres, and that allows you to have well-functioning multidisciplinary teams, expert views on subspecialised topics, and all of those good things, rotation of staff. And, and I, I mean, what my feeling is, we reached this point that we've got to continue to explore those possibilities. Um, the, the idea that Jersey will be able to provide standalone safe medical care, safe clinical care across the whole range of conditions, I think is just, it's just wildly optimistic, frankly. I think we're going to have to look at, look at new ways of doing things across that interface between secondary and tertiary care. And, um, I guess we should want to sink on that trip. Again, not for now, is it worth us, maybe even one of the workshops, to look at some key clinical areas that we can 
start to look at differently, which is picking on what Simon said. So, for example, care of patients with stroke, so the care of patients with complex comorbidity, care of patients with, uh, with, with diabetes, because I've been in this space for 30 years yeah. and very little has moved. We still have these systems that were built up, and that's not criticism of Jersey, it's everywhere, built up in medieval times of the hospital and then out here. Yeah. And as we know, our patients no longer fit that, and that might then free up more time Absolutely. to deal with the bits that you have to deal with. You know, if you've got somebody on a car crash, yeah. they need to be seen. <coughs> and the other example, who of course, is the MOD, the Ministry of Defence. They yeah. have to Absolutely. deal with this Just the time. Same. So, so it might be worth us mm. if, if mm. we can get together at some point mm. with the GPs, but I don't understand the funding. I know it's such a complex array of which minister it sits in, and, and everything. Yeah. But maybe if we come across that, and, and the hospital doctors and the GPs work together to look at different ways of doing, say, four or five key areas. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and to be more optimistic, one would have thought that the that whilst the, if you like, the tertiary care end may, might be made more difficult by the, the nature of an island, you would have hoped that the primary secondary interface and the interface with social care ought to be easier. That, that ought to be something that could be done here more easily than it can be done in many other places. And one, 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 everybody, so. <laughs> <laughs> one, 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 Everybody's related to each other. <laughs> that might be the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll, we'll ask. <laughs> I don't think we need a paper on that. <laughs> Simon. So a couple, a couple of things to say. So, so I would agree that there is a real opportunity because Germany has something that very few other healthcare systems have, which is effectively more a captive po population. For, for routine normal care, people are good, good. They're not flowing out to lots of other places. Uh, and it does have the freedom of its own jurisdiction to do stuff. Um, that, 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 that's a political decision way above my pay grade. But I think on the tertiary point, we need to recognize that not very many people actually need tertiary care. When you do, you want to go to a specialist working in a specialist unit with critical mass. There's really good evidence for this. And that is the norm anywhere. So actually, Jersey doesn't have a unique situation. Any population of 100,000 would expect to travel with such care. In fact, compared to my own country of Scotland, actually some of the communications actually are better here than they are there, or if you go to the west coast of Wales or something like that. So our problems aren't in fact unique, nor are they insoluble. Thank you, Sam. I agree with you. Right, um, to move on now, we, we're going to talk a bit about culture and relation and uh, about freedom to speak up, Guardian, so Ashley, welcome. And, and then Cheryl to pick up on some of the things that Ashley is going to tell us. So, as you know, the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian role was established relatively recently. Um, we've been fortunate enough to have Ashling, who was a great enthusiast for it. Uh, she and I try to meet uh, weekly and, and usually succeed. I, I took the view that the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian should um, report into, have a dialogue with a non-executive uh, rather than an executive. Uh, um, and because I was the only non-executive, that, that's been me. We might want to come back and think about how we address that. Um, but the process has so far, I think, been very interesting um, and revealing. Um, Ashley, tell, tell us how you got on and what you found. And welcome. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'm Ashley today. So, as you said, I've been in post since the end of January um, this year, and Freedom to Speak Up is so new to Jersey, so new to HCS. So, we've really been working hard this year to lay the foundations and kind of build the scaffolding around what we need here for the staff to feel safe to come and speak. 
So in my report, I outlined that 63 people have come to speak to me since March, I would say. And in line with National Guardian's office, um, the categories that they require their guardians in the UK to uh, provide information on are patient safety and quality, worker safety and well-being, bullying, harassment, and any other inappropriate attitudes and behaviours. And they're really the kinds of things that we're kind of seeing here. So everyone who's come to me um, to raise any issues of concerns, they've all touched on each of those categories, I would say. Um, so to date, 14 uh, cases have been investigated and closed. Um, and there have been positive outcomes for the, for the members of staff um, that have approached, and also for the organisation, because not only are we looking to support individuals with their challenges and teams with their challenges, but we're also looking to think about like, how does the organisation improve and learn and grow from what the staff are telling us, because National Guardian's office frame it in such a way that anything that staff are telling us is a gift, so that's how we learn and grow and develop and improve, so it's really important that we're hearing those and looking at the themes, seeing where they're coming from and then acting on them. So that will feed into the cultural plan for 2024. Um, so, in my report, I've outlined that there have been, uh, there's also an element of accepting from the organisation that yes, there have been inconsistencies, um, and from the, the uh, investigations that have been undertaken, organised listening events have been um, organised and uh, improvements made to processes. Um, and as I've said, the the uh, results of people speaking up are not only having an impact on the individual state to day working practices but on the wider teams. So, um, currently, 25 or time of writing, 25 cases uh, were active and open and they're being investigated. So, as Hugo said, we, we've decided that at the, because it's so new to take everything at this time to senior leadership level, it's really important for that group of people in the organisation to have an understanding of what what's the temperature like in the in the other areas of the organisation where they not, might not always have access to um, and that's proven to, to work well. Um, so again I've kind of outlined feedback from individuals, some positive, some again being honest and transparent hasn't kind of worked out for them but equally it's about managing expectations and it's not um, I think staff, even though they accept at times that maybe they they didn't necessarily get what they want, but they can say that due process has been undertaken. So um, it's, it's, it seems to be, it's being received quite positive. Just to move it forward a little bit further, in the UK, the guardians there have um, opportunity to undertake um, the National Guardians training around speak up, listen and follow up. Is run by the NHS, and I think it would be really important if we could kind of, kind of give that to our staff here just because it will kind of further embed what speaking up is and why it's so beneficial for um, patients and staff. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. So, questions, thoughts for Ashley? Oh, thank Claire. you very much. I, I'm a non executive director on another on the mental health trust, and the Speaking Out Guardian and ambassadors has been the single most important issue, important thing driving improvement, uh, I think, in the organisation. And so I'd just like to thank you. And it is something that we should be thinking of investing in, not just one speaking out guardian, but an array of ambassadors that can support you, that the horizon is. And the more you get, the better. And there will be a tail off. Uh, I get them reported according to criteria, such as bullying and, and, and all of those. So sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or points for Ashley? Well, I suppose just to say, you know, it is, I said in my chief officer's report at the beginning of the meeting that, you know, this is a absolute step in the right direction. It's encouraging the people are speaking up. And, and I think some of those, that, you know, the, the ability to speak up now, you know, dealing with perhaps legacy, cultural legacy issues that go back maybe decades. So uh, it is just very encouraging that we, we are where we are. But I, I agree about capacity as well. Uh, I guess I've worked in bigger organisations, but you, you do have more than one person because the workload can, can be, as you know, it can be quite significant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dealing with each of the individuals takes you quite a lot of time, doesn't it? And, um, yeah. 
and we have quite long discussion about mm -hmm. it on a weekly basis. Um, but there is an opportunity here, yeah. and the organisation was taken because it is providing some pretty clear feedback, I think. The themes are, are, are consistent, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think that's hugely helpful. Uh, and a lot of it um, implies the need for cultural change. Yeah. Change in behaviour, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we've collectively got to drive. Um, there's, there's a significant shift in the behaviours that, that sometimes exist. And so Cheryl, you're... Okay, thank you, Ash, for um, sharing that with us. So, following on from what Ash has shared, um, and also thinking about other data sets, there is a consistent theme in terms of what the themes are bringing out. So, um, if we're looking at data from our BeHeard survey, our complaints, listening events generally that we have with staff, uh, our staff well-being when people are um, referring themselves for staff support. Um, we are clear, it's clearly demonstrating that HCS is facing cultural challenges. Um, the themes of staff, as I've noted in the report, um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, I'm just going to assume that the report has been read, um, has, the, the themes have led to um, a list of actions being created and a cultural change plan um, recommending six evidence-based um, um, remedies. Um, the plan incorporates both cultural as well as people elements. And I've got a colleague by my side who is the director of HR who has um, supported in terms of developing this overall um, people and culture plan. Um, but we need to set realistic um, expectations here because we know that cultural change takes time and we know it is difficult. Um, we are optimistic that we are starting to see some shoots. We're starting to see that there's certain areas that have had some more intensive focus for cultural change are starting to change, and maternity um, is one of them where we've started to see some slow changes. Um, but, we, but the plan um, um, needs to be embedded, and um, there are clear um, <coughs> measures within the plan to help us start to look at how that we can monitor that change over a period of time. So my, my recommendation would be that I would come back to board in three to four minutes time and report on progress, um, because this is obviously a big plan to implement. And to, and to be mindful also that um, the first six programmes of cultural change, not all of them are fully funded at this point. Thank you. Thank you. And, and when you come back and report, that will be then on the basis of measurement. Yes. You, you are measuring yeah. as best we can the cultural shift yes. and, and, how, and what we've achieved. Yeah. And then I'm sure people will ask a bit about the funding in a moment. But yes, question. Yes? yes. I mean, the, the thing that struck me, and, and I think it ties into the previous report as well, is that these are very critical pieces of work that are establishing a new way of. Absolutely leaders and the rest of the staff interacting so there's been a long culture of not really believing that if you surface these issues anything would be done about it um, and we have we've developed a very comprehensive plan and i, I congratulate you on that but I thought, the thought that ran through my mind as i was looking at it is can we deliver it because it is wide-ranging it will require resourcing and equally i think to really get the benefit of everything that can come from your area we have to resource it and that's a challenge where we know that we're trying to save money and, and do all the other things. Um, but I think we're only going to get traction with staff and real buying if we can demonstrate consistency in terms of how we roll this out and that we are putting resources behind it. Um, the second thing that I had uh, around this, just thinking about it, is um, I, I, I think it says it in, in the report somewhere that um, obviously a, a good culture creates a climate in which you have good services and good quality of care, and the corollary is a bad culture doesn't, and then can create harms. Um, but I just wonder where the patient voice sits in all of this, because obviously patient voice is also important to holding up the mirror to us as a group of people who are engaged in delivering care, to hearing what patients think of our services and what they think of the behaviours that staff evidence from time to time. And we do have a patient panel, I just wondered where it stands and how it would get involved in, or if indeed it would, or if there are other sources of patient voice that you're planning to, to bring into this. I think that's a, a, a really kind of relevant question. Um, I, 
at the moment we don't have um, a strong um, intervention around bringing the patient voice in other than the patient panel so there will there be some ideas that need to be developed in terms of taking some of what we're developing here as well as the work that Ash has been doing through the Freedom to Speak Up programme um, and going back to patients um, and, and providing that opportunity to reflect and, um, and consult with them. Um, so could we build that into the feedback in two, three, four months time to see how we've progressed that side of it as well? Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm Chris wants to come in and then uh, you go ahead, Chris. Well, no, I'm just, yeah, it's a very good point. And as, as I say, I think that also when we look at complaints, I think, you know, where you see complaints where um, it says staff have lacked compassion, staff have been rude, et cetera, et cetera, are important indicators. I think, as I say, as Cheryl mentioned, of course, cultural change is a slow burner, so bringing your report, which you're not intending to do it every month so you were just not going to see that that movement but um, I think the, the thing for me is in I think you said it Julie is that actually when I first arrived on leading the change team I've always said that it, you know the, the issues around clinical quality the issues around finance are really only symptoms of the culture of HCS um, or indeed the culture of the wider government so so I think it is just so fundamental to making the improvements that we need. And I think we've touched on today, haven't we, in, in all the areas, and maternity was a good example where it's not just a process, it's a culture as regards to escalation. Um, these are so critical, and, and leadership and strong leadership, as we all know, is just going to be the uh, it's central to making that sure that this happens. But they're absolutely right, you know, it, there are, cynicisms understandably as there always is uh, everywhere I've worked around this because people want to see action and actually as you said some people have benefited and some people haven't and some people are in processes that may not so it, it, it is a we have to measure it it's a difficult thing to do anywhere um, and it will be the long-term shifts you know the be heard survey for example we've got a baseline uh, but the next be heard survey for the government is not for we understand that in three years, however, three years. we are going to be implementing quarterly. Yeah, so three years is too long for us, and, yeah. and we need to do some pulse surveys, which you're planning to do, Cheryl, in between on some key questions, so we can measure this more. But I think from the patient point of view, we have got the patient panel, I think complaints is an important aspect. Um, and of course, the picker survey yeah. will also pick up on that. So. Um, but we know, and you mentioned the civility saves lives in the intervention, you know, the, the, the evidence there is clear. You know, if you're not civil, it impacts on your cognitive ability to provide good care and patients suffer in the end. So I think the, the evidence that links culture and morale, using the old term, um, and the quality of clinical care is indisputable now. We, 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 that's why we have to focus on this. Thank you. I, I wasn't suggesting that somehow we'd have metrics like we have in perhaps the waiting list reports mm -hmm. that would show progress over a monthly basis. But I think it's important that we keep this on our agenda. Yeah, we do, do reconsider it at frequent intervals. Yeah. Because I think it sends out a powerful message about we are engaged in and supportive of and we'll do what it takes in this agenda area. Yeah. I make three quick points then come to bear. Um, the, the, the measurements actually is, is, is rather better than I would have predicted in this area. But, Cheryl and I have talked about the metrics. It, it's actually quite encouraging. And I, <coughs> I do think that it's sufficiently robust to track <coughs> the change in culture, by which we mean a change in behaviours. Yes. Yes, that's what we're talking about, is a change in the way people relate to each other and behave with each other and to each other. And, and the second point is that the, the science on this is clear. That if the behaviours are poor, patient care is poor. Yeah, it's really straightforward. This is a patient safety issue, and and it's important. We had a discussion yesterday that's ongoing about the way we behave around this table, uh, because we have a responsibility to model good behaviour for the organisation, because that will have a direct positive effect on the care of our patients, mm -hmm. yeah. and bad behaviour will have a very negative effect on the care of our patients. So this is, this is really, really important stuff, not, not, not just 
soft and cuddly. This is really important stuff. And then on the patient panel, um, I've, I've met with the patient panel who are, are just getting set up and thinking their way through how they might work. I know Chris has been the patient panel and a member of member of no, the patient panel over there. Yeah, too, yeah. And, and um, I'm meeting with Carl Walker later this week. And I'm, I'm going to talk with Carl about two things. One, the relationship with the work that, that Cheryl's doing. And, and secondly, um, I think it would be really helpful at some point in the early new year for the patient panel and the non-executives to meet. Yeah, because the patient panel, I think, is going to be the mechanism. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge, I guess, for HCS. It's also a challenge, frankly, for the patient panel. Mm -hmm. As I say, they're finding their way as well. So, so all of those, those things are, are, are in the mix. Bev. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, there are two measures that, that we ought to be able to track this year. The first one, I think we've already seen some progress in, and that's the number of staff cases that have gone forward into more formal processes and that's because with the support of central government um, they've adopted a triage system which looks at early resolution and is looking to try and reduce the amount of um, uh, uh, you know escalating complaints about behaviors or even harassment etc and we've seen a reduction in our cases um, that have gone to more serious disciplinary cases as a result of that. So that fits in with the Just Learning culture, which we've been trying to um, adopt and, and, and talk about, use that language across HGS. Um, the second metric is in relation to the way we do clinical investigation, because if we apply the Just Learning culture, our, our first thought is what are the circumstances in which this incident occurred as opposed to who is responsible for this particular incident and that changes the tone it also hopefully changes the tone in terms of people feeling confident to report these incidents so i know there's a lot of work to do around some of the incidents and si's to get that number down but in the longer term our aim will be to ensure that all our investigators really do get the fact that we need to ensure that that staff feel that those processes, if they're involved in those processes, that they're fair, they're meaningful, and that the organisational learning then is shared, um, and that the organisation where it's responsible within a system for creating um, a situation whereby somebody has to have shortcut, um, uh, you know, uh, some kind of routine, um, that the organisation takes that responsibility on, um, and that we don't have people who feel, feel that the finger is, is, is being pointed at them. Uh, but these are long-term things. These are things that are going to take some time to embed. Thank you, Bev. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on this? Mm. Yes, Tony. Yeah, can I comment as well? I mean, it's a great, it is a great initiative, this, and for all the reasons that we're saying. And uh, it is, I think, as uh, Julie was saying, it's, uh, emblematic of our wish to have this very clear golden thread that we as the board mm. are really concerned about what, what the experiences are on the front line. <coughs> I think what I'd like to learn more about over time is how managers are um, responding to this, you know, because it can be can be very threatening really when you feel you've looked at something quite appropriately within the policies and procedures of the organisation. Um, that staff member isn't happy, which is fair enough. So then kind of they then kind of leapfrog you. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but it is how it's, it can be perceived. Yes. And so I think there's something about <coughs> giving managers the opportunity to talk between themselves on how this is impacting on their uh, 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 on their management arrangements, how they deal with appraisals, performance management, and everything else. Because some issues which have been raised may not be appropriate, actually. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's the brutal reality. <coughs> but it's difficult to say that without being seen to be undermining the fact that we're all very pleased that people are coming forward. Mm. It's just hard to get right. But I think managers need the space to reflect on this as well. Absolutely. And I, I think you'd agree that that whilst not everyone necessarily is making a point which is fair or reasonable, what we have to do is to listen and respond. Yeah. 
So we may not always respond in the way the person would like, yes, because as you and I, we all know that's actually not going to happen. Because sometimes the answer is no, or we disagree with you. But what is what is not acceptable is not to respond. Mm -hmm. There has to be a response to everyone that comes forward, and that response has to be timely. And that's a particular challenge for people around this table. I understand that, but we, we have to get to the point where that response is delivered in a timely way, whatever it may be. Though, yes. Jeff, sorry, but some yeah. of these will be anonymous, so I don't think you can... No, they're, they're not anonymous. No. Okay, uh, where I'm... is that they don't necessarily... Uh, if they're not anonymous, then I think there needs to be a way of making them anonymous, because what you find is that uh, people are reluctant to put their names <coughs> on to see it as a complaint, mark. Right? So, so there is an opportunity for people to report anonymously. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that hasn't... nobody has enacted that as yeah. yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, but the opportunity does exist, yeah, does it not? Yeah. And then, of course, you're quite right, Claire, you can't respond in, in the same way. But so far, I think all 62 have come forward and, and said their piece, and, and you do what you can to feed back. The crucial thing is that feedback occurs. Yeah, otherwise, this process will not be seen as of any value. Yeah, yeah. We, have to, we have to make it work. Good. Anything else on that? Thank you very much. Now, um, confession, I, I missed out two, two bits of the quality report, I think, it's the patient safety bit. And, and I know Patrick and Jesse are very keen <laughs> to complete that. So, Patrick, Jesse, if you just do your bit on the back to the quality report. Yeah, so the area I would highlight for the board is around um, our VT risk assessment. Uh, this is an area of concern. And background to this is prior to the introduction of Maxims, we used our electronic prescribing system where you couldn't progress through it uh, unless you actually did the VT assessment. Um, with the change that was switched off, as there are a number of prompts within the Maxims system uh, to, to get clinicians to do the assessment. Um, initially, there were some um, big quality issues, but we're now assured that the um, rates are correct in the areas where it's being measured. They are way below uh, what we want and um, it, it, it is uh, of concern. Um, <coughs> my approach was going to be to simply switch on the EPMA system uh, so that it became mandatory again. Uh, but however, I've been dissuaded from doing that by both our Maxine's team and our uh, EPMA team and to an extent our informatics team uh, for two reasons. Um, it's certainly a retrograde step. I mean, we want to use the new system, but it probably does not give us the <coughs> assurance that we want um, as it's only measuring the assessment. Um, and EPMA is not in all areas of the hospital and we continue to have a mixed economy of um, electronic assessment and paper-based assessment. I've been meeting with the Maxims team and pharmacy and informatics in the last few weeks. Um, we do have the ability to see and measure the prescribing, um, correct prescribing of the um, BT treatment. Um, and those, those prescribing rates are significantly higher, which on one level is assuring, but equally um, also not assuring, because we don't know for sure that we're prescribing the right. Significantly higher than? The assessment rates. Which so it be. could suggest people are doing them, but just not recording them. Yeah. Or, sure. it, or it could be other reasons. Well, it's, uh, and they may, we're not assured that they're prescribing the right thing because we can't see the assessment either. Yeah. So the team are, and I hopefully by next week, they will be able to produce a dashboard um, where we'll be able to see both the assessment rates and the prescribing rates. Um, and they'll be able to bring that information back to the next board. I think if we go back to the, the, the cultural uh, elements of this, it's going to have to be a lot of nagging in terms of um, getting people to actually do it because we might be able to measure the rates but we will need to get them to do it so I've been 
uh, working with the Chiefs of Service, uh, and the, you can go into our system and you can see every patient in the building and you can see whether or not they've had BT assessment. Our clinical pharmacists are already uh, ringing clinicians uh, when they, they go th look through the uh, uh, prescriptions, uh, and if it's not done, asking the, the uh, responsible clinician to come back and do it. I know that's happening because they phoned me. Um, but I think we'll also be asking our ward managers, um, everyone essentially, to, to be looking at this on a day-to-day -day basis, on every ward round, uh, at every contact to do it, and I'm hopeful that we'll see an improvement. So just, uh, Chris. So just on VTA, it sort of, I can remember going back into met various other jobs, it seems to be a consistent problem everywhere I've worked about the numbers, the rates of VT assessment, and I think you're right, it just, just requires persistent or nagging um, from pharmacists, ward sisters and, and others <coughs> to just get to ensure that the medical staff do the VTE. Uh, I think it is, it's, uh, for, for whatever reason, I don't pretend to understand why it's such an issue, but it, it does tend to be, in, and you can get those rates up, but it, it is it does require some real attention to just ensure that medical staff complete those assessments. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's concerning, isn't it, really? Um, we all know the effect of that process not working well has a direct effect on the lives of patients, potentially. Yes. Um, so, I guess, is there anything that we can do as a board to, to, other than to say this is crucially important? Um, this is really straightforward stuff, uh, very clear evidence base. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, the, the intention will be that uh, the escalation will ultimately come through the care groups and come to me. Right. Or not, uh, doing it to make sure that there's uh, right. an acceptance when people are asked that, uh, that it happens quickly and they go back and uh, do that assessment in, in the way yeah. that they should. And, and Jesse, are the, the, the nurses fully involved? I'm yes. sure they are. The in, ward managers are yeah. fully involved in right. it, yes. So they are <laughs> calling out where there's a problem? Yeah. To the lead nurse, yeah. To the lead. And are there patterns here? On the one septum ward, yes. some wards are yeah. better than others. Yes. Right, good. That's a very diplomatic. <laughs> one. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, can we put a clear focus on those where they seem to be finding this rather more difficult? Because my suspicion is, and I may be wrong, my suspicion is it will actually come back to a, a relatively small number of clinicians. Yeah. Is that? I'm sure it will. I don't, I don't know. Patrick, there, there, are, there are definitely significant differences between wards. Right. Um, so, so, but I, I, I think there's probably more clinicians than right. Like more than a few. Okay. Than a few. And I think it's making it clear to my consultant colleagues that they hold a significant amount of responsibility. Absolutely. Um, for the patients under their name. So, uh, I'm hoping it won't be too difficult a message to sell. Right. Good right. medical practice, isn't it? Yes. Is it? They hold significant responsibility, which is not only a professional issue, but potentially a medical legal issue. Yes. And that, that's what we need to understand. Simon, did you want to comment? You were well, uh, well, my, my own comment would be that if the rates are in the 20%, it's not a very small number of people who aren't compliant, the majority who aren't compliant. Um, yeah, I, I have a discussion at some other point. I mean, my, my instinct is the same as Patrick's original position, and I'm sure you can persuade for good reasons, but um, you know, just to be clear for everybody, the risk here is that people end up having an, an avoidable uh, embolism and are either dead or have severe problems as a result of that. So this isn't a kind of technical thing. It's a, it's a thing for a reason. Actually, you're right, I mean, the risk is we say, well, we just prescribe it, but if we prescribe the right thing, right. I mean, yeah. So would it, would it be helpful if for uh, the January meeting we had a, a deeper analysis of this, maybe on a ward-by-ward -ward basis, or...? Yeah, I mean, uh, we should... The ability to report it would, should be in place by then. Good. I'm hoping yeah. that will be in place right. for the next week. Chair, Ch Ch well, if, if we do do drill down, we won't have space in the agenda, so I'm not sure how we're going to marry it up as being a board, rather than, rather well, than a scrutiny, rather than a clinical 
guideline committee or whatever. It would be best to the Shoreless Committee, but yes. I'm very anxious because that we don't let this go. You could risk becoming something that we're not. Yes, I agree with that. I take your point. Um, as you can tell, I'm pretty concerned about this. I mean, the, mm. the risks reputationally are just extraordinary. Yes, but then we have to trust our executives okay. to reassure us that it's right, <laughs> because we could go, and then as a clinician, I would start to All get right. even further involved. I, I accept your guidance, right? <laughs> but we, we will have a quality and safety report next time, so yes. perhaps you'd include it in that. Mm -hmm. well, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Anything else for Patrick? Yes, so, um, from um, my perspective, the key things from the Chief Nurse Office is um, the infection control rates remain um, fairly low. So, there was two C. diff cases noted in October, um, but noted although they were in the same ward, they were not connected. Um, once um, investigation had taken place. The number of falls that is reported on the current metrics is um, all of the falls that's reported. The new metrics will differentiate between severe, moderate and low harm falls. And also what we started to look at also is the falls where patients are actually supported to be lowered to a safe environment, um, be that onto a chair on the floor. So initially we've been, we've been counting all of them as falls, but when we've supported them, it's still been counted. That's been separated out now, moving forward. Pressure also, as I'd like to say, has reduced this month, and that's due to the ongoing targeted work. But I'd also like to say that although there was a blip back last month, there is a, looking at the trend analysis for pressure ulcers, it is consistently coming down the um, category twos are um, reducing and lots of targeted work by our touch by build team and across our wards. Um, and there's a current um, initiative going on in the organisation at the moment for that. Um, feedback, so complaints are um, lots of work going on in complaints and we are continually looking at how we respond to our complainants, what our um, how, how often we're having that communication with our complainants because we noted that we, we assign an investigator and then we think everything's happening as it should and that hasn't always been the case. So we've taken um, the feedback team are making a kind of conscious effort to ensure the complainants are updated on where their investigation is at regular intervals. Um, as of yesterday, our response rate has improved and we are at 50% of complaints that are out with the timeline. So we're continually making that improvement. We've still got a long way to go, but we've got a lot of work to do. Um, to be noted that patient experience just isn't about complaints, it's about compliments as well. And we're getting better at actually um, documenting our compliments so, so having those logged into the system because we've not always been um, really good at um, logging our compliments um, and then we've got further work to do which we, took, we will be taking back to the patient panel regarding um, complaints. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. We're at that point now where um, the public are invited to ask questions. I don't think we've got any questions. Emma? I don't think we've had any questions sent. Nothing we? pre-submitted by email. Nothing submitted by email. So, if anyone would like to ask a question, we'd ask that it was something that arises from the agenda. And if you, if you want to ask a question, you're very welcome. Can I just thank the chairman and the team for the fantastic work they've been doing? Because my personal feedback from inside the hospital is they've made a real difference, and then the staff are, are very happy, especially Christopher, Gabby, you've been into meeting them, and that person here opened the door to them, and they're really impressed with that. Um, and OB, for, to be able to deliver a financial report that people actually can understand is quite a skill. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, all I'd like to ask really is, is, I know this team have brought you initially on a one-year contract and 
is there any news on that being extended? Because that would be fantastic if we could extend that. Well, I'll just give an update on that. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yes, we're looking to uh, extend the, the change team and the input of the change team and just sort of thinking about how best now in, say, 2024 to deploy that, that resource um, uh, to maximum effect, considering we're sort of moving into the next phase. But yes, we, we, we have spoken to the state's employment board and they would be supportive of that. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Anybody else? Yeah, yes, please. Right. Right. My emails and, and um, uh, telephone calls have been ignored for months. Yeah. Well, we, you and I talked, so I came in. We, we met yeah. uh, and arrived. And, and, um, That's what I wanted to ask. Why, why is that happening? Well, you've met both Chris and, and, and Patrick, and we will come back to you on the specific issue that you raised with me. But, but there is the more general issue about why is, why do you not have a response, Chris? Yeah, and I think when we met and you got my email address, if you can, one of the good th things that we can look into that is if you obviously send me the information that you've sent to others, of course, because I'll be able to see who you've contacted, yeah, so we can. I've already sent them to you. Uh, to I've not. Yeah, so I've not received your email now. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know whether we've got a firewall problem. Uh, we need, if you send it to that email address, we'll have a look and see I what's happening. I sent it to Jack, Jack um, Richardson, and I sent it to staff. Yeah. And we need to look in why that's you don't that's realize happened. How hurtful it is. No, absolutely. No, we, we should. And uh, I say, I. Yeah. No, we understand. So I've looked at my emails, but I've not actually received anything. So I don't so I don't know whether we've got a technical issue here. But if you if you send me that, madam, to the email and say, Dr. Armstrong's going to arrange to meet with you as well about the things that you've you've raised because I, I know it's upsetting and uh, but uh, they absolutely shouldn't have ignored um, any of your contacts. So we will, as I say, we spoke earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. As a member of the public, I'd like to speak to Professor Hugo. That's I'd me. like to thank you. This is your last meeting at the board for all that you've done. Personally, I find you a breath of fresh air. Well, thank you very much. That, that's, that's very genuinely very kind. I've, I've done what I can to improve things, and I'm confident that the people around me will continue to do that. Um, and thank you for coming and being supportive of us. As you can, you can tell, we are very seriously engaged in trying to improve the quality of care for the people of Jersey. It, it's, it's, it's a fair old road. It's not going to happen next week. But I do think we're making progress. And, and I was struck today that the quality of discussion around this table, um, really our third board meeting, um, it, it gets better, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. There is no doubt that there's been an improvement in the way the board is working. And I think people are very committed um, and will do whatever we can to improve the care. So, so thank you for your kind words and thank you thank for your you. support. Anything else? Good, thank you very much.